All right, guys. Hopefully you all can see me. See me and hear me, or soon see me and hear me. <laughs> Whoops, I gotta put this other thing on top. Hold on. My goodness, I hope you guys can see me. It looks like it's taking a while. I am definitely delayed. I can definitely tell I'm delayed, so I apologize if I if my my chat my answers in the chat seem to be a little bit delayed. It's because I can tell from my live stream um, I look like I'm a bit delayed. Oh wow, we have so much going on. Oh my goodness, um, <laughs> we have a big solar storm hitting now. If you guys were with me last night, you know. Uh, if you are here because you are expecting that I'm going to give you a big solar storm report, no. Today is actually a mini course uh, that we're going to be doing. Last night was the big solar storm uh, briefing that I gave. Before the big one hit, we now have a, a big solar storm that's hitting. I can't tell yet if it's what we called the main course last night. Um, this, uh, and, and good, I'm glad you, you can see me and hear me. I forgot to ask that, but I'm, I'm seeing in the, in the comments you guys are saying that. So thank you. Um, I can't remember, uh, I mean, excuse me, I can't tell yet whether or not the storm that is hitting us is the main event, because remember, there are, there are two glancing blows. We definitely saw one. Don't know if I've seen the second one yet, and I'm looking at some of the data, and it's not quite clear yet whether or not there's another shock coming. I can't really tell. We haven't gotten through what's called the energetic storm particles um, yet, and so it's, it's hard to tell if, if we're going to continue on the decline or if it's going to continue, it's going to start rising again. If we start seeing those particles, those energetic particles rising, that means that there's another storm coming. And so this one has, has not yet, you know, has, it is not yet the big one. Um, if that's the case, boy, we'll probably jump up to a G4. Would not be surprised. Um, right now, I think we, we were, I, th I think we're going to get up to a G3. As a matter of fact, I think, um, well, I won't, I won't bother to look at the updates, but I believe that we were just about to get to a G3. So if we're not there, you can take a look at the KP index. I'm sure we're going to be at a, G, at, at a KP of 7 here just very shortly. Um, and it, it's hard to say yet whether the storm is going to be a uh, sustained southward field. It's just a little bit early yet to tell, but it, it, looks like, um, it looks like it's going to sustain for probably another at least another three to four hours. Uh, at this, at, it's slowly declining. So, so the the um, the views right now may be waning just a little bit, but they're probably still quite strong. Um, and and again, I don't know what's what's in store, but this is a pretty strong uh, uh, storm impact in terms of magnetic field strength. So it's very similar to the filament that we saw uh, the, just the other day with a very strong impact, and it's. Just right now, it's just not looking like we're hitting the, the very center of it, which is strange because it is a strong storm. So that's why I'm wondering if it's still the, the second glancing blow, okay? So just be aware that we may have yet another storm impact coming. Um, we'll definitely get a better feel for it once we're done with this mini course, and I'll get on Twitter and, and kind of update everybody as best I can. This one is not super fast, but because it's so strong, it's going to give us some decent aurora. Uh, so very similar to the to all the discussion that we had last night of the previous um, filament, the previous solar storm that was grazing us. Uh, all of that still applies. So yes, Aurora for the UK, for e Europe, yes, definitely uh, down, possibly down past the Netherlands into you know into into Germany, into into um, maybe the Alps, and and if you're high at high elevation, and we just cross our fingers that it's going to last through um, the evening so that the West Coast can get a great show too, because if so, it'll be easily um, similar to the ones that we had earlier this year. Okay, so let's hope, let's hope. But I'll, we'll know more in a few hours. So with that very brief solar storm uh, update out of the way, <laughs> let's jump into the mini course. It's very apropos, I think, that we're talking about Carrington class events so that I can easily tell you the storm that's hitting now, it's not a Carrington class event. Don't even worry about it. It's not even close. This storm uh, isn't moving fast enough. And that is actually a nice kind of foreshadowing into the storm that we're going to, one of the big storms we're going to talk about today. Because you can, it, you can argue that this storm is not a Carrington class event, but it had the impacts of a Carrington class event in a big way. And we were very lucky at the time that what was the original Space Weather Prediction Center was set up. Back then it was called the... Um, 
SD, I think the SDRC, the, the Solar uh, Disruption Research Center, I believe is what it was. It might have been the S SDFC, like Federal Center. I can't remember if it's which the, what the acronym is. But that eventually became NOAA's SWPSI, okay, which is what our Space Weather Prediction Center is today. And it had only been stood up like two years prior. <laughs> so if this storm had happened two years prior, it would have been a disaster for all of, all of the Western world, um, possibly the entire world. Anyway, we'll get into that in just a sec. So, glad to see you're all here. Um, as always, I am going to thank my, my steering committee. These are the people that help me steer the ship. Um, I, I owe them everything. They, they, uh, they basically help decide where we're taking this, this Patreon project and, and what I am prioritizing in terms of giving talks, in terms of what I develop for courses. Well, not always courses, but in my formal courses, the formal courses I do for Millersville, and also some formal courses that we're going to be talking about um, actually in this upcoming VIP meeting. Uh, we do lots of discussion. The heliobiology panel is here as well. Uh, and so lots of really cool stuff behind the scenes that make such a big, you know, make such a big splash. And then uh, on top of that, of course, we've got the mini course patrons. If you don't see your name here, it's just because I haven't been able to, to add it to this list um, this month. Uh, but trust me, your name will get on here. You all are the reason why I do the, the courses that I do, and you make them possible. So I appreciate your, um, your, your generosity so very much. Uh, you also get a say in what is being taught, and you also get your questions answered first, of course. Uh, and I answer a lot of questions behind the scenes for people, for, for any, anyone in my Patreon family, but, main, but especially the uh, mini course patrons. You guys, you guys make it, your generosity allows the rest of the world to enjoy these courses. And so many have told me that they are invaluable and uh, you allow them to be free. So I really appreciate all of you very, very much. Okay, and with that, <laughs> let's, you guys ready to jump in? Uh, thanks to Lourdes, who is, who is uh, one of my VIPs, by the way. You can see her here. I'm not sure she's able to join us today. I think she said she couldn't. But she reminded me that today is the anniversary of the Halloween events. Do you guys remember the 2003 Halloween events? We will actually talk a little bit about them. I have to do an entire course by itself dedicated to these events. So that will not be today because there's another one I want to talk about that's a bit more... Um, it's, a bit, it's more historical, right? This is more getting closer to our modern era. As you can see, one of the biggest solar flares, actually the biggest one in the space age, was this event here. This was classified as an X-28 to potentially an X-45 um, because it was just, it was occulted, which means that it was rotating off, as you can see, off of the, the western limb of the sun. We didn't even see the full force of this structure or this, this solar flare. <clears throat> and so reconstructions, um, tell us how, kind of, kind of give us a, a range of how large this solar flare actually was. But it was a, a really, really nasty region, region four, 0486. And you can actually see a little bit of its evolution here. I'm not going to go into the details of this region today, but you can see magnetically down here, this is an HMI diagram. This, this shows the magnetic field pointing in and out of the, the plane of, of the sky. And you don't want white touching black. Okay? It's kind of like the American political environment, right? And so you can see this big black streak all the way across this. Man, this thing was nasty. Because all this thing wanted to do is just get rid of it and just simplify its magnetic configuration. Because when you have these two colors back to back, that means right next to each other, you know, essentially right next to each other or on top of each other, you're having magnetic field pointing opposite directions, literally overlaying each other. And that is... <clears throat> a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly what we had. Uh, Scott McIntosh would call this hemispheric band compression. And it's very, very common during low, um, lower activity cycles. And uh, because the, mag the, the magnetic hemispheres are not quite in concert, and so they're arguing with each other, which causes really complicated magnetic patterns that can emerge in these sunspot clusters. And it typically happens as we get to the very edge of um, the very end of our solar cycle, getting closer to solar minimum. And sure enough, we started going into the, the deep solar minimum starting around 2004 and then down, clear down to almost 2008 is when we finally started beginning to, to well, the end of eight, we started pulling out of it. Um, but this was on the late declining phase of the solar cycle during that really, really deep minimum that scared the bejesus out of everybody. 
um, not just because of the events, but also because we, that was when we thought we were going into this solar minimum, this grand solar minimum, and sunspots were going to go away, and it was going to be a maunder minimum, and there's going to be a next ice age and all of that stuff. So this was a very interesting cycle because of that. Um, there was so much about it. But this, this big event, the set of big events, as you can see, um, the X-17 happened on October 28th, an X-10 happened on October 29th, and then this massive one happened on November 4th. So it really is, and this is all 2003, so now it's 2023. So almost exactly to the day, we um, have one of our Carrington class events uh, ha have its anniversary. So happy anniversary. Okay, and so I will talk about that stuff later, but not in this class. Uh, I will bring it up from time to time as kind of like a neat little um, anecdotal, um, you know, comparison, because it does belong on the Carrington class list, um, this, at least the CME that, that hit Earth or the several CMEs that hit Earth. And what you'll see, including the event that we talk about today, what you'll see is something that I've talked about so very much, which is that um, these, when you get a bad actor on the sun, right, when you get one of these nasty sunspot clusters on the sun, it doesn't just fire off one solar storm or one solar flare or one radiation storm. It fires the whole kit and caboodle. And it doesn't just fire it once, you know, each thing one time. It fires it and fires it and fires it and it's machine guns tiki, 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 all the way across the, the earth-facing disk until the thing rotates behind the west limb, which is what it did, see? It's still firing and it went on the far side and it was still firing. <laughs> so these, you know, we just couldn't see it because back in 2003 we didn't have stereo yet. We didn't get stereo until, what, 2008? So we didn't even have, you know, eyes on and yet, believe it or not, you know, we, we, uh, we know that this thing was continuing to, to launch big solar storms because we had coronagraphs. We could see the big um, CMEs that were farsighted. But this is, this is so classic of how the sun works, is that you get these, these really ugly active regions that either, um, either rotate into Earth view, as this one did, okay, as you can see it rotating on the east limb, and it just was nasty all the way across the disk. It actually developed some of its worst nastiness um, once it got it came into Earth view, and it just was a nightmare until it finally disappeared around the, the limb, and then it went and screamed on the far side of the sun. Or so it was either like this, or it's one that emerges in Earth view and then is angry and and gives us have hell essentially for the entire time it rotates. And it takes two weeks to rotate off of the Earth facing disk. So from here to here, two weeks. Okay. So what ends up happening is that you get a solar storm and a solar flare and a radiation storm and another solar flare and another solar storm and another radiation storm back to back to back to back to back. And Earth sits, since the Earth strike zone is like in here, especially for solar storms, it's a little bit different for, you know, other phenomena. You have a massive period of time, like a full week, if not more. And with these big ones, it could be all the way across the disk because these things launch ridiculously large events. You can be literally in the crosshairs for an, an insane amount of time, 10 days, easily. And when that happens, events com compound each other, right? They, they, um, uh, they don't cannibalize. You got to be careful when you say CMEs cannibalize each other. We, we had a conversation about that last night. Um, but what they do is they, they will smash into each other. Slower ones get launched, and then a faster one gets launched right after it catches up to the slower one and compresses it, makes it stronger. Or maybe it doesn't quite catch up because they're both fast. The first one clears out the path, and then the second one can barrel through with uh, completely unimpeded, and it doesn't have to slow down at all. So you get these, these effects that make things more what we call geoeffective. And when you have that happen, not to mention once one of the storm hits Earth, it preconditions the, the Earth to then be really, you know, unsettled. It's already filled up this, the Earth, the Earth system so much that it doesn't take much to set, set it off. So you can have one storm hit, which then, you know, preconditions the Earth to storm again, and then the other one hits, and blah, oh my gosh, all hell breaks loose. And that's often what you see with these events, is that it's, it, in the Halloween event, we had several solar storms hit back to back. And that's what caused all the, the nightmare for us. So I will do an entire class on the Halloween events. Um, it's just too much to cover, to try to cover that and cover the, uh, 
the the historic event. I'm hoping we can get through the historic event and maybe a couple other smaller ones that have similar that I'm gonna I'm gonna show as similar modern day examples of the kinds of things that the 1967 storm um, could have done had we had modern more modern technologies. So that hopefully it gives you um, a good um, you know basis of comparison, right? Okay. So enough of the Halloween events, but happy, happy Halloween event, happy 20th anniversary. And, and you know, happy 20th anniversary to a, a essentially a Carrington class event in the modern age. Sorry, I'm moving this cable aside so that I don't, <laughs> I don't trip. That'd be fun. Um, okay, so what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going to give a little bit of a review uh, I will go through these charts very quickly because you've seen them before. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our Carrington class events just to kind of get everybody back in the, the feel of things. And I'll briefly talk about the 1972 event just to get you to remember what it was. And again, it's all about just reminding you what we went, you know, the types of, the, the wide variety of Carrington class events, how we define them, and how the public has managed to turn them into these I mean, seriously, goblins and, and demons that, that really, it doesn't really need to be, they really don't need to be looked at this way. So, as I've talked about, uh, the common myths of, of a Carrington class event, these are the, the definitions in the public eye, right? Mega flare, kill shot, micronova, power, power grid killer, Armageddon from the sun, God's wrath, or basically any doomsday event uh, that expels all, you know, spells the end of all days for anybody, you know, for, for us under a weakening Earth's magnetic shield or, you know, people who carry around electronics, right? Um, I mean, we've had so many movies and, and stuff on this. I, I don't even know. Maybe maybe some of you guys can tell me. Has there been a movie out yet about Earth's weakening magnetic shield, some doomsday event that talks about Earth's magnetic field dying? I should find, I should see if I could find that because that's becoming such a big thing in the media uh, and, and, you know, on, honestly on YouTube. That I really should find out if there's a if there's a movie or, or some type of um, show, TV show or series or or some special on Earth's mag magnetic field. How because it's weakening the dipole field component is weakening. It means the end of days, and it's probably going to be done by the sun or I don't know what. But it'd be very interesting if if anybody knows anything like that. Uh, please put it up in the in the chat, and I will because I, I would be really excited to to take a look at more deeply into that. Um, but anyway, so, the, so we, we've talked about this kind of stuff, and I've talked about it in length. Um, no need, we're living it now. See, that's the kind of answer, if that, if that is the day after tomorrow evol evolving the magnetic field, that's that spirit you saying that. I don't remember if the day after tomorrow had the magnetic field, the weakening field. But see, when we get answers like, no need, we're living it now, you really think we're going to just die off, really, because of this? because of a Carrington class event is gonna hit the earth when the field weakens. Just like we talked about before, the power grid companies are loving it because weakening magnetic fields mean lower GICs, weaker GICs, the geomagnetically induced currents. That's what causes the power grids to fail. So if you have weaker geomagnetically induced currents, you're not gonna have as much stress on the power grids. So what was a horrible event that with a G5 level uh, solar storm hitting earth? before, back in the 2000s or, you know, back in the 1800s. That today, with the weakening field, especially if our dipole field disappears, that may not be a big deal. <laughs> On top of that, the poles are moving. And so having a quadrupole field as opposed to an, oct a, 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 you know, as opposed to a dipole field, that may take some of the stress off. And it may put a lot of the poles over the oceans where there's no land and no, no worry about disrupting big utility companies. <laughs> so it's not just as simple as, oh gosh, our field is dying. It, it's a very much more complicated concept. And, and whether or not, you know, certain things are going to get worse, and that's particulate radiation, because it can penetrate further. But certain things are going to get better, like the geomagnetically induced currents that cause power grids, which is what basically all doomsday, if you look at all doomsday um, documentaries on space weather, which, you know, there aren't many, but all of them have this kind of thing in them, where the 
magnetic, you know, the, the power lines are exploding and heating up and we're all going to go, you know, to hell in a handbasket and, and, and we're going to be fighting and killing each other because we've, we've been blown back to the, to the dark ages. Well, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. So we, we just, we have to be a bit more scientific about how we look at this stuff and looking at it just from um, the public, you know, the popular pop culture view is, and the, basically the way Hollywood has trained us is not necessarily the right way to look at it. And it causes a lot of undue anxiety um, that we really don't need. Okay. And so this is what I've always talked about. You know, these images are just, they're outrageous. They're just outrageous. So talk about fire and brimstone, right? Okay, so yes, we cross all that out and say, let's, let's look at this stuff in a different way, right? So a scientist, how would a scientist talk about Carrington class events? Well, we do it by eruptive signatures, perhaps, the CMEs or even the ICMEs as they're traveling to Earth, by solar flare signatures, you know, is it an X class, right? People say, oh, that's an X class solar flare coming at us. That's a Carrington class event. No, X classes, those are flare classes, classifications, not CME classifications. You can have an X class flare with no CME at all because that's not a CME. The CMEs are what cause these big storms that, that we worry about at Earth. The, the big solar flares just cause radio disruptions. But those are, as you will see in this upcoming event that I'll talk about, that's bad enough <laughs> because of what things can do, because of what humans can do and what humans, how much humans rely on radio communication, on good radio communication, right? Um, but solar flare signatures are, are definitely a, a way you can classify them by particulate radiation signatures. So these are solar energetic particle events. Right, we've talked a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit more about it now, uh, this, during this event as well. And by effects at Earth. So there's all sorts of ways that we can define what a Carrington class event is. And most of the time, as we learned, Carrington class events have one or two of these that are insane. But maybe not all of them are insane. Right? The big thing about Carrington class events is that they usually rank really high in all of these categories. And that's what makes them a Carrington class. But not, they're not top notch in every direction, in every single category. Um, and so it becomes very tricky because what could be considered a Carrington class event for, for radio communications is not going to be a Carrington class event for the power companies, right? So it becomes, it really becomes kind of a dance as to, well, what impacts are you looking for? What, what really do you mean? Um, and that's kind of what we've gone in through, not only with the, the original Carrington class uh, event in 1859, but also as we begin to categorize these other events, the 1972 event, for instance, that we went through last time. Uh, and so, you know, Chris Russell and, and Janet Loom and, and Pete Riley a while back made a really good paper that talked about this. And we, we went through this a bit. And what's, what's cool, one of the plots inside this had to do with, and I'm not going to go through this in super in depth, but just to kind of remind you, had to do with when you're looking at the, the event, the um, active region on the sun, and you had a particular angle that you viewed that that, that particular um, active region was relative to Earth. So if it wasn't on the east limb, then it had a wide, you know, it's, it's not, if, if you're center sun, right, or you are Earth and I'm, and I'm the sun, if I have an active region that is right deadline center of the sun, of me, okay, and I'm firing it at you, that's a zero degree angle. But if I have uh, something on the east limb, and I'm firing it this way, right? I'm firing it like this, then that's some some angle, okay? That's off by 20, 30 degrees or whatever, right? Or the other way, same thing. And so that's how they did this, is they talked at the observer flare angle. So it's the relationship between the observer and where the flare is being launched. And so you, you can see as you move further off of that, basically, Earth-Sun line, um, that direct shot, then that, that um, there are different events you know, that cluster. And then you have, um, this is transit time. So obvi there, obviously this, the fastest event that we ever had was the 1972 event. That's what we talked about last time. Um, it made it to Earth in just over 14 hours. Whew, fast, right? But there are other events, right? Our 1859 event sits over here. It's not the fastest, right? That was one of the things we recognized right away is it wasn't the fastest event. So. People oftentimes think the 1859 was beyond the pale in terms of everything. It was just the best of the best of the best, and it's not true. 
the one we went over last time was the, the best in terms of speed, but it wasn't the best in terms of other things. Okay. And so this, these are all, this is all review, right? So we look at the Halloween events. Well, they fit. Here they are. Here's the one that happened um, in the 28th and 29th, I believe is when they, that was when they were launched. I think they hit the, t the 30th and 31st. Um, and then we had one that hit later, a little bit later. But you can see not quite as fast, right? Around 21 hours. Okay. And they were actually shot about the same. They basically had the same kind of uh, angle that the 1972 event that had, the fastest one. So they definitely didn't have a, a further path to take to get to us than the 72 event did because they had, you know, about 15 degrees off of the Earth-Sun angle, right off of the Earth-Sun line, rather. So they traveled the same path, so they didn't have a longer path. They were just slower, right? And so some people classify these as superstorms, not Carrington class. But a lot of people classify them as Carrington class. The reason why they get Carrington class, or one of the reasons why, notice there's two of them back to back. Okay? And we'll see that in the storm that we're going to talk about today. That didn't even make this ranking. We're going to talk about the, tw the, the May 1967 events. You don't see it in here, do you? I don't think. <laughs> I've looked before. No, I don't see them. And you know why? Oh, that's right. You know why? 40 hours. It took 40 hours for them to hit Earth. Not very fast, but boy, did they have an impact. Really amazing. So we'll talk about why. Okay. And here's an example. I'm not going to go through this slide. This was one we we're just talking about the Carrington class event and the magnetic crochet and how we were able to, to get, how we were able to tell what the, how quick the, the storm arrived, because here was the magnetic crochet for the solar flare, and then we actually had the CME hit, I guess, right here. Yeah, storm onset right here. So it was very easy for us to calculate how quickly the storm arrived, uh, even way back then when we didn't have much in the way of observations. Um, but for all of these different storms, you can see, uh, you know, October the 29th and 28th and 29th event were about 20 hours, right? The 1972 event, that was four, a little over 14. And the 1859 was second placed second. All right. So I guess I didn't need, I probably didn't need to have this um, on here. So what we're going to do here is look, is look at some of these other signatures, right? Because speed obviously isn't the only one. And um, do I want to talk about this? I probably shouldn't have had this in here. This is just review stuff that I thought, oh, we, I should probably have this in here. Um, oh, yeah, there is a reason why I have this one in here. Let me see, where can I stand? Okay, so if we take a look at just some of the, some of the biggest events for, for all of the different uh, types of, of signatures, right? So you can have a sudden ionospheric disturbance. We'll talk a little bit about that. that was a, that's what we call an SID. That was the magnetic crochet, right? And we also have other SIDs that, that cause um, radio blackouts. I mean, the magnetic crochet can cause radio blackouts as well, but just in a small area. But the actual um, radio burst is what is, is another aspect of radio blackouts. And so we're going to be talking about that with the 67 event because that was such a big deal. Uh, but as you can see, look who got the, the number, the biggest value was the 2003 event. This November event, the 20th, you know, our 20th anniversary of this event that you just saw, that November 4th event. This was the one that, that kicked the 1967 event out of the winning spot. Okay, so, so it's another reason why I'm talking about the Halloween event. It's the 20th anniversary of this event, but this one kicked the May 1967 event out of the spot for sudden ionos ionospheric disturbances. And you'll see why. So that big flare that you saw, okay, you got to actually see it. Uh, it's the only one that's bigger than, than the May event that we'll talk about. Solar energetic particles, we had, of course, the Carrington class event. That was the biggest one for SEPs. Okay, so the polar cap absorption was still the largest on record. For solar wind, uh, speed, right, the 1972 event. That's the one we went over uh, just last time. And then geomagnetic storms, we had the March 1989 event, okay, and the, the Great Railway Storm in 1941. I'll probably go over these two I think I've gone over the 89 event before, but I'll probably go over these two events um, maybe sometime later uh, and do it together, 
Okay, and then for Aurora, it was the 1872 event. Uh, you know it was big because back in 1872, we sure didn't have the cameras we have now. <laughs> but something tells me um, we we see Aurora. I mean, we I, I've I've looked at it when I've looked at the 1872 event, and I've looked at what they saw, and um, I would be surprised if in the modern era a much much weaker storm is going to hit and will surpass what we've seen here, what were what was recorded here. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, and part of that may be due to uh, the fact that our, our field is changing. And definitely as our field changes and we become a, a quadrupolar field for a short while while our dipole field flips, boy, that's going to change everything. Because, especially for aurora, because if you have four poles, you know, you see, you see aurora near, much more near the poles. And so we're going to start seeing equatorial aurora. And I have talked about that. So that's going to change everything. And maybe that's cheating. <laughs> I don't know, but it'll sure be pretty while it happens. <laughs> um, but no, again, it's not the end of the world. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna talk. All right. So quickly with the 1972 event, right? I'm not going to go on and on about it. But notice the extraordinary solar flares, right? Multiples. Okay. Because these big ugly regions, oftentimes they just keep firing. It's like, it's like every time they fire something, they load something else in the gun. And it just it's just a magazine that they can just tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick very, very quickly. Within 24 hours, they're firing. Um, and, it's, and you can see that today, even when we have really ugly active regions. We had a couple big solar flares today. They're impulsive right now. We're not getting big CMEs from them. But, um, but it's not uncommon for these, these active regions, when they're not happy, to just continuously fire. Okay. Um, we did have white light flares. You will also see that in the 1967 event. We'll talk about the white light flares. That means there are lots of energy being given off, right? Because usually you can't see solar flares from the ground. You can only see it if it's a white light flare from the ground. That means lots of energy. If it's going to bring that much light down into the lower uh, wavelengths, into the visible range, right? Usually we, have, we see it in X-rays. We see gamma rays. We see EUV, right? But we don't have it penetrate that atmospheric window because it, the window doesn't open up until the visible range. So you have to really get energies down into the low energy wavelengths in, in order, and have a ton of it in order for it to be seen uh, by telescopes on the ground. And so that's how you know you have a very big flare is when you see white light flares. There's a disappearing filament. I believe this was the one. Um, it was a, what I call a core filament. You can see it uh, even circulating up in here. Um, these things are extremely dense. And so that when they, when they launch, they're explosive and they're extremely dense and they launch very strong radiation storms. And so uh, there was lots of stuff that was destabilized, right? We had huge radio bursts, um, radiation storms. We had uh, an EMP, a G, an E3 component of the EMP because this thing was so incredibly fast, hitting us so incredibly fast that it just walloped our Earth's magnetic shield. But it didn't have the right magnetic configuration to give us a massive geomagnetic storm. So even though it gave us something like an 800 nanotesla per minute change of our field within just two or two or three minutes, and in Canada about 2,000 nanotesla a minute change, outrageous impacts on, on the power grids up there. Um, it didn't give us a big incredible storm. I don't think I have it here. I think the DST, uh, meaning the storm disturbance index, what we call it disturbance storm time, that's why it's DST. Um, that measured, it's like something like 150, minus 150, I can't remember, it was something, something in the 100s. It was not a big deal. I mean, you know, a storm, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if the storm we're getting right now has dropped us below, if we look at DST right now, has dropped us below 100, maybe even 150 now. Uh, we're sitting at a G3, yeah, it's going to be um, probably 150, minus 150. So we're feeling that level of intensity now. The difference is the storm that's hitting now, for example, is only moving at about 450, 500 kilometers a second, where this one was like over 3,000. So it ended up being a bumper car, right? It slammed into our, our magnetic shield so incredibly hard. But because of its magnetic orientation, it wasn't able to pump all of its energy. It wasn't able to reconnect, you know, have, have just like magnets, it didn't have the magnetic field oriented such that these 
two fields on opposite directions would reconnect and then form a single magnetic system so that this CME, this big solar storm, could pump all of its energy into Earth's magnetic system. It was like this. And as you know, magnets that have the same orientation, they repel, right? So this was a big bumper car. It went boing, and it compressed our magnetic shield, which then gave us that big E3 component, which then knocked all the grids down and detonated the minefields, <laughs> right? Destruction of over 4,000 magnetically sensitive DSTs, the destructor mines. Do you remember that? This is why it was classified, <laughs> right? Um, and there's the declassified document that talks about where the minefields were <laughs> near Vietnam. Oh, boy. <laughs> they didn't know at the time, you know. Um, and this was 1972, so it wasn't that long after we had set up the, the old-fashioned Space Weather Prediction Center, as we'll talk in, about in the event we're talking about today. Um, and so, you know, at least they had an idea reasonably quickly to check with, with the folks at the, at the SDFC or F SDRC um, to, to find out whether or not it was a solar storm related. But some of the conversations that were had, um, you know, because a lot of these scientists work in the open and they see these military brass come in and they can't ask certain questions, or they'll ask a question and the military brass will just stay quiet. They won't even talk, they won't even answer. They'll pretend like the question was never answered or asked. <laughs> I've had a couple conversations like that. And it's like, oh, I obviously asked something I shouldn't have. <laughs> you know, and, and so these people are like, well, I don't really know the details of that, but I can tell you about the sun. Um, so there were some funny conversations that, that uh, Dolores talked about and some other papers talked about um, that were kind of amusing little anecdotal things from some of the scientists back in the day, remembering what it was like to get kind of trying to have these, si these big military brass come in and talk to them about it um, without giving up out the, you know, without them having, being able to tell them what was really, why, the, why they really needed the information. But it was quite interesting. Okay. And I here was just talking about some of the, um, the actual eyewitnesses to some of the stuff where they witnessed explosions in the water and mud spots, and there's the destructor mines, okay. And then, yeah, here was the modest aurora. Oh, good, I have it. Oh, DST was minus 125, good night. Boy, that's small. We might be sitting at that right now, okay. So the DST really wasn't all that big. So it really was the E3 component. It was really the, the EMP that caused all the hullabaloo for this particular event, right? And you wouldn't expect that, that that's, oh, that's what the Carrington Venna did? It only, it didn't even give us a storm that, this wasn't even as strong as the Halloween events. Halloween events had like minus 300. So wh what, how can this be, you know, take the, the gold when it comes to Carrington class event? Well, depends upon how you characterize the Carrington event. So this one was the fastest on record, but not the strongest storm by, by anything. So we had some decent aurora, I mean, some modest aurora, rather. Um, high latitudes, all sky cameras talk about that. But we had a very strong um, uh, radiation storm at this one, right? Super fast, launches a big radiation storm. What does that do? That, that just trashes our upper atmosphere, heats it up quite a bit. So we had, along with the, the bumper car effect and everything else, we had a lot of heating and a lot of atmospheric inflation. Uh, and that would have spelled disaster for you know, clear up even up to 900 kilometers, right? That would have spelled disaster for Starlink, right? Which launches to here, launches around 350 now, right? Before they even launched down at 210, that's when they lost everything. But they launched at 350, you think that would have saved them? Not with a storm like this, right? Between it with a 500 to an 800% variation in density, outrageous variation in density. So a lot of people recognize that um, you know, this is a big deal. We worry about ozone holes and stuff. But the polar cap absorption event that happened because of the radiation storm uh, caused the ozone hole to rotate, semi-rigidly semi rotate for 50 days, meaning it didn't get better. It didn't necessarily get bigger once, once the whole thing was over, but it didn't get better because the tearing up the ozone is it's, a, it's what we call a radical reaction. So one, one, one uh, molecule of, of oxygen steals an electron and it, but it steals it from another <laughs> molecule. So it'll steal it from ozone, from another molecule of ozone. And so 
by stealing that electron, now it's happy, but its neighbor's pissed off. <laughs> its neighbor's upset. So, so what ends up happening is that you, you don't solve the problem. You just kind of rip through a whole bunch of your neighbors because you keep stealing from your na nearest neighbor. And, and that's how you can basically not solve the ozone and let the uh, ozone anneal because, and have, have these holes rigidly rotate because it's not solving the problem. It's just passing the buck. So it took something like four years for, for the ozone hole to close. Okay. So we see that with these big storms. You know, ozone holes, um, strangely enough, are, are very common phenomena. And a lot of it is solar storm. It's not all carbon, you know, fluorocarbons, right? The big CFC scare of the 1970s. Uh, and of course, amateur radio operators in Russia got a uh, temporary e-layer due to the radiation storm. So that was pretty interesting. And then the last thing about the um, 1972 event, right, was the Apollo program. That we were lucky, lucky, lucky because Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 were on either side of this very big radiation storm from, from this event. So Apollo 16 was, was um, just before 1972 and Apollo 17 was, um, was after. Um, and I, I thought this was 1972. I think this is 1972. This was March or something, right? Uh, and then this happened in August. Whoops. And this radiation dose would have been lethal. You know, this says fatal. If you can't read it, it says fatal. So this was normal. This is uh, uh, annual exposure for radiation worker. That's the orange line. This is radiation sickness. That's this darker orange line, and this is fatal. So had the Apollo 16 astronauts or the Apollo 17 astronauts been stationed on the moon in August as opposed to March or whenever 17 happens, um, they would have died right there, right in their spacesuits. And it would have changed everything in terms of how we look at spaceflight and manned spaceflight. I doubt we'd have the Artemis mission talking about going up. But silly us, we still haven't learned, right? Because these guys went up during, the Apollo missions were during solar maximum. And if Artemis stays reasonably on track, they're going to be up near solar maximum. I, I, I'm just hoping, I'm actually hoping that things shift down a little bit and that we'll, we'll get away from solar max. But of course, we do have to worry about getting too close to solar minimum because if we're close to solar minimum, then the galactic cosmic ray flux becomes a problem for the astronauts as well. So there's always this, you know, give and take when it comes to to space weather and the human flight, human space flight. Um, it's 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 always a hazardous day. Let's just put it. There's no such thing as a safe day in space weather, irrespective of whether sun is active or the sun is quiet. Okay. So the one thing someone asked me the other night if I knew Dolores, and, and Dolores had always talked about. Um, last not, having big solar storms these really big solar storms occur every 40 to 60 years and um, and yes I you know I, I said yeah I, of course I know her um, this this is actually this is one of the slides that she gave me from when her when her present when she gave a presentation about the 72 event back in um, oh my gosh it was AMS of like I don't know 2018 or something I think it was 2018 because that's when she published the paper but yeah, I chat with her all the time. You can actually see Dolores on, on my, my opening video on my, um, uh, if you look at YouTube and you see that little opening video for, that introduces who I am, you'll see Dolores. She's actually in that video. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased. Her and Kent Dabiska, Mike Cook, um, and I forget who else is in there, but, but you'll, you'll see them. Um, very good colleagues of mine and good, great friends too. But one thing that Dolores has, has asked over and over is why do solar cycles seemingly have last gasps? Uh, and why is, it, why is it like every 40 to 60 years we, have, we seem to have these things, these, these last gasps, which meaning, meaning big events, big massive events that occur, because the August 72 event um, has, was, was part of this as well. Uh, it always happens to, on the declining phase of the solar cycle. And the interesting, the interesting thing has, if you talk to Scott McIntosh and the NCAR crew, a lot of it has to do with how, how the very tail end of the solar cycle, how the magnetic field annihilates itself so that the new cycle can start. Because we have these, these bands, these magnetic field bands that come in and they are pushed, um, these opposite polarities, but they're pushed toward the equator. 
uh, during solar cycle activity. And, and it's just part of the solar dynamo process. But when the magnetic hemispheres are not aligned properly, or they're not in concert, so they're, they each are experiencing a different part of the solar activity cycle, they're kind of going by their own clock, so to speak, then that can cause <clears throat> magnetic fields to be a bit, um, uh, it can cause a, a, a more complicated fields to, to be generated. And as these bands get pushed and pushed and pushed closer and closer to the, to the equator, it forces so these complexities to, to, to squash, literally squash each other. And so you get this very layered cake um, of magnetic, like a, you know, you do frosting, you do ice, you do vanilla and then a layer of chocolate and a layer of vanilla and a layer of chocolate. You can get these very uh, complex um, magnetic field configurations right there at the, you know, near the equator that can really drive some very intense storms. And because they're reasonably near the equator, they also drive very near, very strong storms near Earth. Because, I mean, obviously, right now at solar maximum, we have solar storms that are launching to the north of us, to the south of us all the time, right? There are lots of filament eruptions and even active regions that will be launching stuff that will miss Earth because it's to the north or to the south. Because the sun's dipole field right now is almost gone. So we have what we call a multipolar sun. And here's another thing for those of you who are worried about Earth's magnetic field going away. The sun does it every 11 years, and it's fine, right? And it comes back. The Earth does it just a lot more slowly. And, and so things change, but it doesn't, you don't see the sun becoming a, a totally different entity. Uh, it, it, in the case of the sun, it just means that its activity occurs in different locations. And with Earth, it just means our activity, our response to the, to the sun is going to occur at different locations. But it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that, that it's going to be the end of humanity. It, it never has been. You know, it's never meant, been the end of all life on Earth. In fact, even Miyake events, when we talk about these massive, crazy massive events that are beyond Carrington class, right? You, we've seen many, you know, a ton of evidence of these Miyake events in tree rings. That's like... Well, if you can see the event in tree rings, that means the tree survived, <laughs> right? It didn't obliterate the planet. So if, if we had, if, if Miyake events and these big massive events obliterate the planet or obliterate all life on the planet, we would never have seen one in the historical record of, of organic substance. So, you know, it's, it's, unless it's completely fossilized and some of this stuff isn't, I mean, some of these trees um, they have harvested, and it's it's interesting, and you can see that the, you know the Miyake events w will be in a tree ring, but it won't be like the last tree ring. So, in other words, the tree died because of the Miyake event. You wouldn't see it, right? It would have killed the tree before the tree had a ring to to display. So, obviously, these trees have li have lived past Miyake events, have experienced them, and lived on. So, it's I just find it odd that people think that that solar events, solar eruptive events, have to be the doomsday that everybody believes they are, when there's so much evidence to the contrary, everywhere. Um, I, think, I think Hollywood has just taken over too much. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox here. Um, okay, so I will open, <laughs> actually before I jump into the 67 event, uh, as you can see, the war narrowly avoided. Um, Let's, let me just check with you all and see how you guys are doing. Um, do you have any questions on that review or about Carrington events or anything else? Um, let me just get, let me just check your pulse right now. That's right, this is, um, I'm probably a little bit delayed. I don't know why, I'm like, it's like a seven, seven to ten second delay right now, it's crazy. Um, okay, so let's see. You guys are talking about moons. Solar max now is weaker than the 70s. Yes, solar maximum. Yes, Susie Cat. Solar max is weaker than it was in the 70s right now. We're actually still um, down in the... Um, oh, goodness. We're still down lower than um, the average solar, solar cycle. And I'm sorry, I, I paused because I realized <laughs> I didn't mention everybody be nice to Jerry Ryan and Mike Richardson. I, I see, as a matter of fact, I see Jerry here right now. Thank you both to both of you um, for moderating this, this um, 
this feed. Uh, you guys are, are wonderful. They are the moderators. They are VIPs as well. And they do a fantastic job uh, moderating these things and keeping everybody on topic. Uh, so if you have a question and I'm not, and I don't see it, ping one of them because anytime they're on, uh, it gets my eyes to flash over there and I see um, they're able to get my attention when other people can't. So, um, yeah. So if you have questions and, and you keep putting them up and it doesn't, um, you know, it's not letting you, you or I'm not, I'm not catching your, your comment, just give it to Jerry or, or Mike or ping them and say, hey, can you, po can you boost this for me? And likely I will see it. Okay. Oh, and Jerry is saying, oh, today's, today's latest DST is minus 152. So, yeah, there you go. We're already bigger than the 1972 event, which was the fastest event on record. Does that mean today's a Carrington class? No. <laughs> no. You see what I mean? It's tricky. It's very tricky trying to characterize Carrington class events because you have to look at so many different factors. Right? And so that's, that's why I don't, when I, even when I see big solar flares, I don't automatically say, oh, this is going to be a Carrington class, or this is going to be a big one, or this is the planet killer, or you know, half a dozen other um, descriptors that a lot of people use. It, it just doesn't make sense to do that. So, okay. Three me emails today with G1 flares. Yeah, well, careful. G1, uh, that's not a flare. That's a, that's a geomagnetic storm. Flares will be M class. G, the G class is for geomagnetic storms. Um, solar flares, either you're talking about radio uh, blackouts, that will be the um, R uh, level, which will be the R1 level for the M flares that we've seen. Uh, and then, of course, the flare classification itself is the, you know, A, B, C, M, and X. But those, you know, flares and CMEs are different. So you can't say a G level for a flare because it's, they're two different phenomena. Um, oh, Valentina's theory. Uh, her theory is that, um, I think the sun has already disproven her theory, that the sun is going, is going to continue to slip into a deeper maunder minimum, into, into another maunder. I don't think, I think we're beginning to come out of it. Um, it's going to be an interesting ride. I think we're in a Dalton, if there's anything. But, you know, the sun has its own timeline, and I don't think that we're able to, to understand it nearly like we'd like to. Um, so mathematical, uh, statistical analyses aside, uh, the sun refuses to be categorized all, all that easily. So that's my opinion. Um, solar flash is definitely someone's intellectual property. Commander Scove, <laughs> solar flash. Well, that, what is that like the, the green flash that we have in Hawaii? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, Heather, you say, I love you, Dr. Scove, you and your passion. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. I'm glad you get stuff out of this. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming in and wanting to learn about this stuff because you guys are the future when it comes to understanding space weather. This is going to become our weather. Um, uh, you know, it's going to become our weather in the 21st century. So you're, you're very welcome. And Susie, you're very welcome. Um, <laughs> hugs and mods. That's great. Okay. HP 30 still at 7, so we're, st we're at a G3. Still awesome. Awesome. I'd, I'd f open it up, but I'm, I'm, I'll get lost, and I'll spend another 30 minutes doing storm analysis, and that's not what today's about, so I'm, I'm really restraining myself. <laughs> Can we make power from these storms? Uh, well, we get power, whether we like it or not. That's what the geomagnetically geomagnet induced currents are. Too bad we don't have to store that power or use it, um, because that, that's what makes the transformers melt down, right? They get free energy. It's green energy. We just have never learned how to harness this stuff. Um, and the, the, the transformers aren't meant for it, right? But they do have reactive power. They, they do store some of it, but it's not really meant to be, you know, power grids aren't meant to be used that way. And so it does damage transformers if it's too strong and too long, right? It can handle strong for short period of time, but it can't handle strong for long periods of time. Um, and especially the old, the uh, wet transformers, as you guys have, might recall me talking about in the ground effects, right? The Earth, I think I, that's the E series. I go into depth with regarding the transformers and the difference between a wet and a dry transformer and why wet tra transformers, which are the older ones, are the ones that are really in trouble when it comes to these big GICs um, and why we need to try to replace them as, as much as we can. 
Uh, okay. So it looks like I'm not seeing a lot of questions. So good. Hopefully you guys are enjoying the, the review before we dive into the, the big one. Okay. Oh, here's, this is cool. Gumbos, you said I was 18 and I was a big Apollo geek. 16 in spring 72 and 17 in December 72. I don't remember anybody bringing up the August event. That was incredible. Yeah, really? You don't remember? Well, that's just it. It wasn't a big geomagnetic storm. So it really, and it didn't have a big aurora. It's only the storms that have like massive aurora, right? Or have, you know, have really wide scale blackouts uh, down low. I bet you Canadians remember the 72 event far better than the United States people do, or even Europe, um, because it was the United States, you know, it was the Western hemisphere that was on the night side when that hit. And it was only a short period of time. So with that EMP, it doesn't last for super long. It lasts for minutes. So if you aren't in the right location at that time, you may not get it. It may not impact your grids nearly like it did, you know, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, but because it also didn't have a lot of aurora, it, it escapes the public eye. But if it had killed those astronauts, those Apollo astronauts, holy merd, that would have been the Carrington class event, right? It wouldn't have been the 1859 event. It would have been the 1972 event. That's what would have been our standard candle when it came to a Carrington class event. So it's really, you know, pop culture plays a significant role in how we look at these events. And it plays a significant role in what Hollywood chooses to mimic. Because imagine if it had been the 1972 event that astronauts died, all doomsday stories about our sun would have been about radiation storms, right? Just zapping us and killing us, and we'd just fall over. <laughs> Right, or skin would be all would be like, you know, spontaneously combusting because of the radiation. Right? That's that's what they would have chosen. They wouldn't have chosen like rocks from the sky on fire or aurora streaking across the skies in, you know, Singapore or, you know, buildings catching on fire. Right? Because with the the <clears throat> with the telegraph lines um, in 1859, right, you had the telegraph machines that sparked and caught the paper on fire, which then would catch buildings on fire right, or rooms on fire. So then that's how we look at it now, right? Uh, or even the Great Railway Storm, same kind of thing. They had telegraph, um, they had shacks, they had, they had, you know, the railway switcher shacks and stuff, and they had telegraph connections there, so that was one thing. They also have the big rails themselves, which conducted also, conducted uh, electricity. We'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about the Great Railway Storm. And they had wooden shacks that then would catch fire. So they did have buildings that caught fire back then. But these are from really big geomagnetic storms, from big CMEs that cause these massive storms. Yeah, and so that's what takes the cake when it comes to how Hollywood perceives these, these Carrington class events. But if it had been the 1972 event, if that had shaped our understanding of them, then we would have likely been making movies about doomsday being spontaneously combusting people. <laughs> <laughs> or some, some very sinister radiation storm-based, you know, nightmare. It's, I, I don't want to. I don't want to visualize it too much. It's a little TMI. Anyway, it's just it's very interesting. It's spooky, but it's interesting um, when you think about how pop cult culture shapes our public perception of of things, and we sometimes need to disconnect from that a little bit if we want to look at things rationally. Okay, so. Um, oh, that's sweet, Mike. No questions because you do an outstanding job of translating information. Thank you. I, I'm, you know, wonderful. Okay. Um, here, here's one. Is there a concern the recent strong geomagnetic storms arising from fairly small spot CMEs will cause problems if we get larger flares? Rising from fairly small spot CMEs. Um, no. Small storms... Small, small CMEs, you know, all they can, all they really do when it comes to a big storm, all they really can do, no, baby, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, all they can really do is precondition the solar wind. So what they do is they sweep stuff out of the way so that if we get a big, you know, let's say, let's say for, for, you know, we have a bunch of filaments or something launching off the sun and then we get this big, ugly, you know, angry actor and it decides to unleash, you know, whatever it wants to, to fire at us. If those filaments had kind of cleared the way and made that solar wind, what we call precondition, that solar wind, then this 
bigger storm could come unimpeded. And yeah, it might actually cause that storm to get, you know, a smooth sailing all the way, all the way to Earth. It won't encounter traffic on the way. It won't be slowed down by anything, right? And so it can just speed on its way to Earth and not decelerate or anything. So we get a bigger impact from that storm. Um, the smaller storms, though, how much can they cause the bigger storms to, to like if a bigger storm slams into a small, a, a little teeny tiny one? Oh, I don't know. Would we notice? Because um, the bigger storms are so big that the little teeny tiny ones, it would probably just look like solar wind, you know, being being compressed. Would it would it make a massive difference? Probably not. I think preconditioning probably is a is a is a bigger thing. But there's no doubt that if you have back to back to back storms, irrespective of they're small or they're large, if you have them back to back to back, they are going to, um, as a composite structure, um, they'll end up making a much bigger impact on on Earth than otherwise. They'll also lengthen and extend the amount of storming you have. And of course, the longer you storm at Earth, the more effects you can get, the more damage can be done if it's a, a big one. And it also can cause the effects to continue to, to rise and increase if, if everything is configured the right way. Right? But there's so many factors. It's really hard to answer that a priori in a specific way. I can do it generally like I did here. But specifically, I almost have to see the event, right? sadly. I wish it weren't that way, but it is. Okay. Is a solar storm pancake shaped? Sort sort of. It can pancake, but the core of the solar storm looks like this. This is the driver. <laughs> it's a slinky. And if you look at my uh, what I guess it's the C is it the C series CMEs? I believe so. So if you look at the C series, which is I think the very first one I did before I was even on a green screen, I was doing like the one or the first couple on on TV screens. I probably should redo those at some point. Um, you'll see that I, I play with a slinky and it's because the, the core, the main structure that's driving uh, the event, it'll come out of the sun if like, if this 1967 is the sun, this structure will launch and it'll fire out like this. And so it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, it looks, <laughs> it's not really a pancake, but it'll pancake out here in the front where my hand is, this, this side where I'm shaking it it'll pancake here because it'll flatten a little bit. But the legs of the structure will typically always be connected to the sun. And so the thing will kind of stretch out like this. Um, and yeah, I can't, I can't take time to really go into the details. And I don't think I have a picture of it in this, in the, in this chart set, but maybe at the end. Maybe I do. I'll, I'll, I'll look. I'll look. Okay, guys. Sounds like I've got, love me some pancakes. Sounds like, yeah, me too, I'm hungry. Uh, sounds like I've got some decent questions answered here. Okay, good. All right, so let's get started. All right, so another one of Dolores's uh, wonderful gifts to, to the history of space weather was the great 1967 storm. And this is an open paper uh, in space weather. She was an editor. I'm not sure if she's still the editor of Space Weather, but she was the editor for a while. And, and, it, and what's nice is that it's open. It, so you guys can download it and take a look at it. Now, I will give you a disclaimer right away that there's going to be a lot of text here. Sadly, there's not a lot of pictures. I've tried to get as many pictures as I could from, from different um, uh, articles to kind of help bolster this stuff. But sadly, there is a lot of description here because there's not... Uh, back in 1967, we didn't have a lot of observations. That's number one. Number two, I'm not sure all this stuff is completely declassified, uh, or if it were, that was all done in white papers and briefings, so there wasn't a lot of, of um, diagrams to go with it. And the third disclaimer I'll give is because I probably would have been able to get more, except there's this big solar storm happen happening, <laughs> and I was doing a live briefing yesterday, so that took a lot of my time uh, that I otherwise would have gone and dug up a few more uh, interesting pictures <clears throat> if for no other reason to show you some of the, the uh, facilities like the, the um, SD, SDRC and uh, kind of what the, what, what the buildings looked like back then, what, where we were, you know, kind of maybe drawing a few more connections between how we started radio astronomy back in the, basically 1945, we started radio astronomy. That became a field 
uh, it was a really interesting history on that. And from 1945 up to 1965 is where we had some of the biggest solar cycles of, in history. And during this period is when we started realizing, goodness, we really need to be very serious about the sun because it's, the radio disruptions were, were a big, big thing. Uh, during these during these particular solar cycles, and so by 1965, that's when we set up. That's when we first started really setting up the the solar uh, disruption research centers or federal centers. I forget which. Again, I can't remember if it's an if it's the SDFC or the F SDRC. Forget about that. Anyway, but Dolores talks about all of that in this paper. Uh, like I said, it's a lot of text. Um, so. You know, not always a little bit of a dry read, but for you history buffs, you might really, really like it. But she had to set up a lot of it because otherwise you don't understand the context. So I will do my best to give you some level of context, but I want to focus even more so on the observations itself because we are talking about Carrington class events. So I want to give you an idea of what, why the 1967 event really can be looked at as a Carrington class event from the perspective of its impacts at Earth and specifically from its perspective of the radio disruptions, okay? So starting off, and I hope this, I hope this is big enough on you guys' screens. It really isn't big enough on mine, but um, hopefully this is big enough on yours. This is kind of an overview of the period of time from the 21st to the 31st of May um, in, in 1967. We had this big, ugly actor rotate into Earth U. I'll, I'll show you it in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but this, night, this is a nice plot because it shows Explorer 34 as well as a couple other um, uh, observations. In this case, they're all, I think this is all radiation storm stuff. Yeah, it is. So we're looking at time on this axis. And this goes from the 21st, as you can see here, by the day, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, da, 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 to 31st. Okay. And Explorer 34 wasn't launched until like the 25th, 24th, something like that. So we didn't have data from, from Explorer 34 until you start seeing the solid lines, okay? But you can see here, these are, from those of you who are familiar, these are radiation storms. And you're seeing um, the particle flux going up here, you know, in a logarith logarithmic scale. So you can see how many orders of magnitude. One, two, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. So six orders of magnitude. Make sure that's... Six orders of magnitude, and so you can see the particle storm started somewhere in here. Okay, can't don't know exactly when. Started up in here, and then, boom! There's the there's one, uh, likely the ESP of one event. So this is when one CME hit, and then you go down, and then you get another one. It's another radiation storm with another another hit. There are uh, other CMEs in here, um, and you can see, uh, these are solar flares. My goodness, I can't even read it. This is, what is this, East 39, East 39, East something, I can't tell, East 25, then West 02, then East 19, then West 20, then West 23. I can't read what, is that 09, East 09? Or is that East 90, what is that, I can't say what that number is. East 69? So there were several different regions then, because if this is East um, 39, if I'm reading that right, then, then having later, because everything rotates from east to west, so you should see kind of a gradual movement from east to west with these regions, and you kind of do, except for this one, this is an outlier. So what this means is that this might have been a different region. Uh, well, obviously was. The sunspot doesn't jump around. But, um, so we had lots of flares, and you can see here labeled solar, SR, SFB, or SRB, sorry, solar flare radio burst, okay? Or solar radio burst, if you want to call it that. There's another one. There's another one. So we had three big solar radio bursts. We had lots of solar flares. We had radiation storms coming up, and then there were CMEs as well. Okay, so goodness gracious, um, yes, we had. Uh, let's see. It says solar flare locations in the east and west longitudes with respect to the central, yeah, with respect to central meridian. So it's that same kind of thing. We're right as I'm, as I'm, if I'm the sun and I fire a solar flare, you know, along the Earth Sun line, that's zero degrees. This is going to be the east to some degree up to 90 degrees, which is going to be, you know, obviously 90 degrees from you, right off to the side. And then this will be west 90 degrees, right? So we're talking about on the earth-facing disk, and you can see lots of them, okay? Um, yeah. So 
really strong radiation storms, especially this first one. This is 1 to 10 MeV. This is uh, greater than 10, but look down here. This is greater than 60 MeV. It, if I recall, they had something like se uh, greater than 80, 80 MeV particles from this particular radiation storm. Really high energy particles, what we call a hard spectrum. So looking just at the overview, and like I said, there's going to be a lot of text here. Okay, um, If I can get off of the page. What, what, what did I wanted to, to show uh, in this? Not only that, the, the, as you'll see, the, the, the polarity of the spots, there was a, a, a polarity where the, the, the fields were pointing opposite of one another, and those regions squished in. That was something that, that we'll talk about a little bit, um, which is where the white light flare was seen on the ground. Uh, but they're talking about um, it produced extraordinary hours-long solar radio bursts. See right here. Uh, a two-ribbon H-alpha flare, seven minutes of localized white light flare emissions. Seven minutes. That's an insanely long time to have white light flare occurring. Unbelievably in intense, and we'll, we'll, I'll talk a little bit. And, and in most places, the, the viewing conditions were horrible for this. And you'll see some of the images I'll show you. Horrible viewing conditions, and yet they were still able to see this intense emission in white light that lasted that long. Most of the time, white light flares last seconds, seconds, not seven minutes. Um, okay, it says, so multiple hours of enhanced X-ray emissions, several measure, measures of day-side uh, uh, solar ionospheric disturbances or sudden ionospheric disturbances, that's what SID means. These are the radio disturbances, so magnetic crochets as well as radio blackouts. Uh, they went off scale. We'll talk about that. Two mid-latitude solar observatories, Sac Peak and, and New Mexico and Sycamore Hill, uh, uh, Massachusetts, observed the events in real time. Okay, so that that was what we're kind of what we're going to be going over here over the next you know little bit. Uh, this is a paper from Najida et al. or Najida and, and Oral, uh, and whoops, I should stand over here. And really what I wanted to kind of kind of talk about was the the just to get you or I guess centered the biggest impacts that we had and I guess I could go back here and talk about this the biggest impacts that we had had definitely had to do with the sudden ionospheric disturbances the basically the radio blackouts from this particular uh, set of events for those who recall be talking specifically about solar flares and radio bursts. So this is a, a, another set of mini courses. Um, this is my, my um, was it the F series? I think it's the F series, right? It's the flare series. We talked about how radio bursts and emissions, uh, how that, how that, the, how it's, they're correlated. So when you have uh, high energy radio bursts, that's being created really, really close to the surface of the sun, like what we call below the X line. And when you have, you know, type, when people talk about type 2, type 3, I'll take a drink in a sec. When we talk about type 2, type 3 bursts, this, this has to do with the coronal mass ejection moving out, or type 2 bursts at least, have to do with the coronal mass ejection moving out and, um, and, the, and you don't typically see really high uh, radio bursts, really high frequency radio bursts, when you have a weak or, or even a normal uh, solar eruption, when you have a big a solar flare that's just a average. And the reason for that is there's just not enough energy to accelerate the particles down to, uh, you know, they, they get accelerated down to the surface. Um, it doesn't allow them to emit these really, really high frequencies, so microwave emissions and higher, right? I mean, well, it is higher, it's a microwave. But, you know, we're talking gigahertz range and, and, you know, tens of gigahertz. The times that you see particles that are accelerated to such a degree that they're able to emit that, that high level of, uh, of radio emission, you're also going to see very, very intense X-ray, hard X-ray emission as well. And you're going to see oftentimes gamma ray emission. And it's also going to, to, in the extreme cases, it's also going to allow you to emit light that is not, you know, when you get these, the, um, the plasma, in this case, and I probably should have had a, a chart on this, but uh, when you get the plasma to evaporate, you get these, these the, the 
material gets so heated that it will it rises and it begins to emit light in in the extreme ultraviolet and you get these what we call the post eruptive arcades that begin to burn if you guys recall all this right so again go look at the flare series and you'll see all that and it's very rare to get white light on top of that but when you have so much energy it's being dissipated in so many different wavelengths you are going to get those big white light flares you're going to get the long duration hard x-rays that's just intense and brilliant and then you're also going to get the most high frequency radio bursts that you can that you know are measured that we typically measure and this is going to be in tens of gigahertz uh, oftentimes and sure enough when you're dealing with in this case i guess when you're dealing with seven minutes of white light of flare emissions and and very strong x-ray emissions you can better believe you're going to be getting big solar radio bursts as well. So that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, and it was during the May 23rd event, the, the solar flare associated with that, you know, or had that occurred on that day. And what I'm going to show you here is just a single plot. I, I don't know if I'm going to show much more from Najita, but uh, this was just 1800 to 2020 on this day. Uh, Sorry, I've got, got family over. Uh, so this is just a few hours on this particular day. And what you're looking at here are uh, different panels. This one is, these are in different, um, this is, this is a, a radio burst emission in the 800, uh, 880, or 8.8 8 .8 gigahertz range, okay? This is soft X-ray signatures. This is hard X-ray signatures, so it's higher energy, sig uh, so it's the stuff that's right at the foot points. And you had a lot of hard X-ray uh, um, emission. Soft X-ray emission occurs at the top of the loop, just below the X line, just below. If you guys remember, I really should have had a picture. I probably should have had one on here. Um, but there is a the. <laughs> should I try? Should I try to? I, I should probably pick out my iPad and start drawing on it. But there's a um, there's a hot flare loop. And then you have the X line, and then you have the CME that sits up top of it, and the CME will launch off this way. And the hot flare loop is where you get all of that soft X-ray emission. The hard X-ray emission is either right at that X line or right at the foot points of that of that, um, you know, where the flare loop attaches to the sun. And the hard X-ray to get hard X-ray to be extremely bright is is really it really intense, right? Soft X-ray will glow all for for a lot, you know is actually a decent um, indicator of, of, a, of a coronal mass ejection being launched out. But, um, but when you get hard, strong hard X-ray emission for a decent period of time, you know you're going to be getting massive radio bursts uh, at very, very high energies, um, high frequencies rather. And so you're seeing a lot of that here, right? Uh, and then on top of that, we've got, of course, here's the white light emission. Okay, and that's, that occurred for about seven minutes over the, this... Um, really hard x-ray and then up here is um, now they're just doing an integrated intensity I don't rec oh it's H alpha so this is getting closer to extreme ultraviolet okay so you expect this H alpha to to glow pretty much like the soft x-ray glows so that's why you're seeing this so this is over the period of time and of course you're now getting another one um, this is likely another another flare yeah it is obviously because down here you can tell at 8.8 .8 gigahertz you're getting a big burst Right, that went up over uh, two, is that a thousand? Yeah, uh, two orders of magnitude change. And then look at this one. So with something that ended up being a slightly softer uh, eruption, because it was, you know, part and parcel of this one, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, this, this, the, the, the active region was already having, you know, um, it was already in the, pro, in the, how should I say this? It was already reconfiguring and trying to, to, you know, realign. And because it hadn't quite gotten down and probably hadn't gotten quiescent, more stuff was coming up from underneath. Its magnetic configuration was probably all, all askew. Man, it let out a radio burst that is so big it went completely off scale, as you can see. So the 23,000 is where they're saying it, it was. So way off scale here, um, multiple orders of magnitude. And that was the radio burst that, that really killed a lot of us because, uh, or killed a lot of things because 
uh, if it was going up even at 8 at 8.8 gigahertz, it was actually even larger at, uh, I think, 670 megahertz, which we'll see in a minute. So here is the active region cluster. This is from, actually from Najida's paper, and I'll, I'll show you another version of it here in a minute. I'm not going to go into all of the details, but um, you can see the different in the polarities, the N and the S, and they're trying to, you know, from ground telescopes, right, they're trying to get an idea of what polarity, what magnetic polarity these, these particular structures are, because back then uh, we didn't have much in the way of, you know, magnetic imaging like we do today. So you can see it's a big set of, of clusters. This is, this is where the, the main gist of it, these were the two polarities that were coming together of, you know, these two sections of opposite polarity. A lot of, uh, in this case, I think this was north, and then this is the south, southern, uh, southern polarity. These, these two sunspots were coming together, and these two sunspots were coming together, okay? And so it created this very strong neutral line right here. And as you can see what's shown right here, right here. Where is the other one? I think it's right here. Yeah. Right there. You can barely see it. These two spots. White light flare. Okay. So that's what they saw. But as you can see, it was a big cluster. And that's very typical. Um, because what you're getting is probably, probably you're getting one sunspot emerging right underneath. It's like having, remember we talked about them being submarines? They, they rise and then they sink. And what you're likely seeing uh, in this case, what they were seeing was literally like an armada, <laughs> the enemy armada of some of, of su submarines were rising and, and, you know, coming up to, to the surface right underneath <laughs> a, a, an existing armada from the other team. <laughs> so as that flux emerges, as we call it, um, you're going to have a lot of magnetic mixing. And, and on top of that, we're having this compression where these two regions were coming together. So it just made for a, a perfect storm. And by comparison, here's, I just put up the, the uh, 1859 event so that you can see, look, you know, look at the complexity of this, of these sunspots. And you're seeing all the sunspots colored in, in dark. Okay, and then some of these other regions in here um, are, are like the penumbras, right? And just the, the, the regions that, that I forget, I forget all of the dotted, dotted, yeah. The dotted outline is the author's attempt to separate one polarity from another because you have these penumbras that kind of show you where the, the, the part of the, you know, the part of the spot that still, that still, it's like the part of the submarine that is still below the water. Remember we talked about, so the, the very darkest part of the spot is, the, is like where the, the, the submarine, when it pierces the surface of the water, it's completely black if you look down on it from an aerial view. And the part of the submarine that's still underneath the water you can see it in the water. If the water's clear enough, you can see that dark shadow underneath the water, but the water still kind of looks, you know, you, you still can tell it's water. Um, so it's not quite as dark as the black thing that's now pierced the surface. So that's what the, the top part is, and what they're trying to show with the dot, dot, you know, the dotted line or the dashed line is kind of where the penumbra, where the part of the submarine was that's still kind of under the water and trying to separate out the magnetic polarity so they can better get an idea of what parts of this were completely unstable. And so you can see there was instability here. There was definitely the strongest line of instability was here, right? And then there was a weakening, some instability here, obviously. And then, you know, these, these spots out here were not so bad. By contrast or comparison, this is Carrington's white light drawing. This is the, white, the ribbons of the white light flare here and here. Okay. But you can see, once again, trying to draw the sunspot itself and then the, the penumbras, the slightly light, lighter shaded regions. Lots of sunspots, but just a certain part of a cluster, almost as if one, one cluster of sunspots emerged through, right, came up through the, the other set to make this nasty region in here. Not much different, right, not much different. So there's another, uh, this was from Sac Peak. I think I have, um, do I need to, other than giving these guys credit, I want to make sure that Mastis and Stover get credit for, for this, uh, um, this image that I'm going to put up here in a second. Um, so now they're just re repeating the same stuff. So here is an image. Um, 
So this is the one we just saw, right, from Najita. And then here's a different drawing. It's slightly different orientation. You're basically, the, the three spots that you see here, okay, are these spots here. Doom, doom, doom. Okay, got that? So it's, they're looking at it from a slightly different angle. But when I put this up, oh, shoot. Do I have it? I thought I have it. Oh, I, okay, I do it here, too. Okay, so when I go to the next one, you can actually look and see um, these are from Sac Peak. These are actual images of the sunspot grouping from their, from their vantage point. Remember, if you're looking at ground telescopes, this, the, uh, the cluster may look different, right? It may look oriented differently or, or, or something. Oh, which reminds me, I, I should show the happy face that the sun made uh, in one of the sunspots the other day, which was like literally right during the, the November 4th um, uh, anniversary of the Halloween events. It, there's a sunspot that literally has a little happy face on it. It's really cute. And depending upon how you're looking at it, if you're looking at it from the ground, it's either an upside down happy face or a right side up happy face. It's kind of funny. But maybe if, I, if you guys remind me, I'll show it to you. Um, but that was been on the sun literally on November 4th, if you look at the, the actual sunspot drawings or sunspot um, images from SDO. So here you can barely see this dark region, this, 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 okay, should match kind of this region and this, this, this. So they took the diagram and they oriented it, you know, the, the right way. And so what you're seeing here is just kind of what the, the view of the sunspots look like. I don't, you know, at different times, because this is when some of the big flares were happening when you had actually the, the big H alpha and white light flare. You can actually see here they're diagramming what the, where the white light flare is. And I'll talk about that in just a second because here is part of it. So during this period, now we're looking at, I'm not going to go into the details too much of how they did all their imagery because they're kind of overexposing and underexposing the imagery depending upon what wavelengths they're showing and how much. And that's what this, this plus or minus two angstroms is showing. They're, they're, they've got it on a particular um, you know, wavelength and then they're kind of opening the wavelength a little bit or, or underexposing. In this case, they've, they're underexposing the image to try to see where the peak of this flare was. But this here is where they saw the white light flare. Okay, and then the H alpha ribbons were, um, were just on the inside of it. But this thing lit up like a Christmas tree. And so they found that the peak of this, this particular flare was so intense. Uh, remember, this is on the ground. Okay, so all of this, all of this is white light as far as I remember. Um, and it lasted for seven minutes during this period of time, if I read the paper correctly. Really surreal. But they found that they, they tr were trying to find exactly where the peak of the flare was, and it looked like it was eight, eight, um, 1844, eh, thereabouts, when 15 seconds, I guess, I guess, is what they were really trying to nail it down. But sadly, back then, we had very little, uh, you know, very few observations to go on, and no space-based 24-7 observations, and definitely not high cadence. It's really kind of hard to do that, because they have to actually take, take images. Uh, and they're, I think they're doing photographic plates, right? So it's, it takes a while to do exposures. Um, here's a better set of images. But as you can see from this, and I pulled this out of Dolor Dolores' paper, I believe, uh, you can see it lining up very, very beautifully. And here is, um, so you can see where the H alpha ribbons are as opposed to the white light. So here's, right, and then this whole thing lights up like a Christmas tree. I mean, the whole region goes up, including flaring down in here. Uh, it's, just, it's just crazy. And then you can see even more. Okay. So this was a, a very unusual, one of the, the first events that we actually had where we were able to see so much on the ground um, and, and capture it with actually two observatories being able to capture it simul simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> and so the three, the three flares that were measured was basically what I call a triple threat. We had um, an M3 flare, and if you guys remember, some of you who remember the coronal mass ejection, um, when we talk about coronal mass ejections, what was the first uh, spacecraft that had a coronagraph that allowed us to look at uh, coronal mass ejections being launched off the sun and actually seeing the space weather events that could possibly hit Earth. That was the OGO-7 satellite. Here we're at OGO-3. 
give you an idea, kind of couching it where, as to where space weather and how, how much of an infancy space weather was at. We were still four satellites away uh, from getting to OGO-7 that, had the, that flew the first coronagraph in 1972. Okay. So we had uh, M3 uh, flare at on, on the 23rd, an X6 at uh, 1846, you know, just a short period later, right, half an hour later. And then we had an X2 at 1953 while this flare was still decaying. So we had that really big flare, that's what we had seen. And then this one is where we had, as far as I, I, I know, this is where we had um, the very big uh, radio burst. Am I correct? Like I said, I would have studied this better. Yeah, I would have studied this better, but I have that solar storm to deal with. So, see right here, 1940. So this was the second one. The big white light flare was that X6 class flare. And then this one, which is slightly lower, had the massive radio burst. Okay. Sorry, I have to keep jumping back. So it was still an X class, but it was an X class, an X2. Okay. Now, the extreme, these radio burst emissions uh, of this, of the, these, of, Flare, the X class and the, or the X6 and the X2 were the largest recorded at 606 megahertz at uh, 2 and at 7, wait, I think that's, I think that's supposed to be 2.7 gigahertz and 9.8 gigahertz, which indicated that significant inter interference and signal loss obviously were, were occurring over uh, Europe and, and USA. And you can see in this plot, hopefully you can see this, this again is... Um, Hours, starting at what, 1800? 1800 to 22? Yeah, 2200, I can't see on my small TV. Uh, from 19, or from, from May 23rd, because remember we had the, the, two big, the two biggest flares we're talking about is flare two and three, the two X class flares, okay? So here we're looking at, again, different, different traces. Um, why did I pull this out? Oh, right, right, because of this, okay. And you can see the X-ray, the X-ray flux. So here's, I think this was the first one, right? Is this a precursor or is that the first one? At 1817, no, this was the M3 <laughs> at 1817. Then these were the two X-class flares, the X6 and then the, the X2. Um, this is X-ray flux. This one is um, another set of X-ray flux measurements, but this time from, from Explorer 33. And then here are the radio frequency, the radio bursts. This was at 88, or 9.8? No, 88, 8.8. .8. Oh, I, I think I wrote that wrong. It's not 9.8, my fault. See all the typos I have? 8.8, uh, .8, not 9.8. .8. Um, you get a small burst here and a bigger one here. And then at uh, 2.7 gigahertz, that's this one. And then here is 606 megahertz, okay? And this one, and, and there, these are, this is logarithmic scale now. This is just so that they could get them on the scale. It doesn't look like they're that big, but it's just so that they can get them on the scale here. Insanely large, okay? And um, <laughs> uh, again, the largest ever recorded for these three events for radio bursts, um, at least at that time. Now, if I recall, where we are talked about, the biggest sudden ionospheric disturbance. And that's what, we're, that's what we're calling these. And, there, there's, and remember, sudden ionospheric disturbances, especially back then, I think now we separate them out a little bit, but back then, sudden ionospheric disturbances were, um, were just anything in the ionosphere. I mean, it could be radio burst, it could be the magnetic crochet, it could be, you know, the, uh, lighting up the D layer and, and causing um, HF radio propagation to go down. So it could be from X-ray and EUV, that's what causes the, the ionosphere to go. It could be the radio burst that's literally the sun screaming, and it's just screaming louder than, than you know, your radio can, can transmit. Um, uh, and, and, or it can be you know, some other disturbance in the ionosphere, some ripple, some heating, some something that causes your radio propagation to go all wonky. All of that was kind of couched in what, we, what, what are called SIDs. Today, SIDs, I believe they're a little bit more careful, and uh, at least at the papers that I've read, we talk about SIDs more, more from a function of uh, looking at like traveling ionospheric disturbances and looking at, at, at disturbances in the ionosphere that, that um, are, are, are obviously caused, oftentimes caused by the sun, but not, not always. And, 
And when we talk about radio bursts or we talk about the D layer being ionized from like polar cap absorptions or just solar flare X-ray and EUV, we distinguish those. But back then, we didn't. So it's all lumped together, okay? Uh, but really what was incredibly significant about, about this was the, the range, especially at, in the megahertz range, because we were so using, you know, so desperately relying on HF radio communications. We didn't really even care that we had, you know, this burst here at, at, at almost 9 gigahertz. We didn't care, right, because we didn't use those frequencies. Today, yes, we do. <laughs> okay. Now, let me read this text down here from her paper. It says, from the, or from, from the totality of reports above, we can, we can understand that the radio communications radar monitoring during the early to middle, late, middle afternoon hours of local time on the May 23rd in the central U.S. and Canada were subject to significant interference and signal loss. Simultaneously, some of the fixed high-latitude uh, radar faces directly pointed at the setting sun as it produced record-level radio emissions. Even the, the um, I, I keep skipping over the acronym, the BMEWS faces with non-sun-directed orientations likely had side and back lobes that were subject to the solar RFI. So even, even ones that even ones that weren't directly looking at the sun, you know, had issues from their side and their back lobes. Meaning that we, and we know today, for instance, when you have a big radio burst, you, if, you're, if the sun is in the line of sight, then you will have issues um, because if the sun is screaming and you're, you're communicating directly to, let's say, an airline, okay, or from one, you know, radio tower to a radio tower, if it's a direct line of communication, that's the most robust line of communication you can have. It's not Skywave, where you're bouncing off the ionosphere. You're doing direct line. That is typically robust under most conditions. The only time it's not robust is if the sun is in that line of sight. So you're trying to aim straight into the sun, or you're trying to aim straight away from the sun, and because it's a straight line. You know, it's, it's, you can think of it from the perspective of like a baseball player trying to catch a fly ball right in, and the sun is in the way and they can't see it, it blinds them, right? You can't see it coming. Same kind of idea, but not visually. In this case, it's, it's because of the radio burst, but that the sun's light is blinding them because it's, it, it's, it's the, the sun's radio noise is blinding them in a sense. It's, it's, it's making them deaf in a sense because it's, it's louder than even the direct line communication. And so the, the, trans, the, the, the receiver can't hear it, okay? or it ends up causing what we call echoes. We've seen that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that with the 2015 event. Um, so they're talking about, about that where it said, but it was even worse, because it said even radars that had, that had non-sun-directed orientations likely had side and back lobes that were subject to this radio interference. And it's crazy to think that we actually had a radio burst so loud that even direct radar that wasn't aimed at the sun, <laughs> right, didn't have the sun in the way in its view, in its viewfinder or, or anti, you know, opposite its viewfinder, right, where it's like this way or this way, um, that it could just be anywhere that a solar radio burst could be so loud that even direct line communications will be nailed. Uh, that's pretty intense. So, <laughs> That doesn't happen all that often. Okay, so here's the problem, right? Herein lies the problem, and I said, I, I mentioned again, with, with this paper, there's a lot of reading, and I, I definitely say go to, go to Dolores' paper and definitely read if you're a history buff, because you'll get a bit more. But I'm gonna pull out just a little bit of this information. Um, so during this period of time, right, 1967, I mean, we were, we were dealing with Cold War. And the Strategic Air Command developed an, air, uh, an, an alert force concept and exercised it often. For the aerial fleet, these were multi-minute scrambles to prepare bomber aircraft for launch in the shortest possible time. As noted on one website dedicated to, to the SAC history, uh, quote, to keep airmen trained and ready for alerts, uh, the SAC headquarters often dispatched alert exercise messages to its bases. These exercises ranged from Alpha, Bravo, Coco, and Delta. Alpha exercises included the crews scrambling to their plane. Okay, that was it. The Bravo included startup getting into the plane and then starting up of the aircraft. Coco exercises involved the aircraft actually taxiing now to the runway. 
So, right, so we're talking about Cruz just going to the plane and then standing down. The next one, Bravo, is Cruz getting, getting to their plane, getting in the aircraft and starting it up, okay? Coco, the air crews getting to their plane, getting in, starting it up, and taxiing. Can you imagine how much funding, how much money this costs to do this stuff for these drills? And now Delta. Delta exercises, if I can find it. Um, okay, so it says, Coco exercises involve the aircraft taxiing to the runway and readying for takeoff before the exercise would be called off. So these alerts were reasonably rare, right? Even Coco alerts. But the Delta exercise were the rarest as they actually sent the aircraft into the air. <laughs> so they were running these types of exercises and you have to have radio communication when you're doing these exercises. And you have to have radio communication all the time when you're in this kind of high alert phase, right? So this is where our military was at the time, where they were routinely doing some level of these exercises, either you know Alpha, Bravo, or possibly Coco, if things were getting too heated, right? So, so radio communications for command and control of the alert forces were crucial, especially if aircraft took off into the air. And the SAC's primary communication system, this was the, what they called giant talk, relied on the, on the HF bands 6 to 30 megahertz, okay, with supplemental communications at higher frequencies, but it's only VLF, I mean um, VHF, right? Maybe, maybe, I don't think they even got into the UHF yet. So this was the, the issue was that when these solar flares, they, they, they have to have radio communications all the time, and they're conducting these art exercises quite frequently. So when the sun did this, what do you think when they couldn't get through to any of their crews? What do you think they thought? It's a jamming event, right? So they literally freaked out thinking that this was a jamming event. And, and well, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. And because of that, they actually had to have the, the members from the SD, you know, the Solar Disruption Research Center, come in and say, no, 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 this, this, the sun is doing, the sun is giving us this, these incredible radio bursts right now, and you must stand down. So we got super, super close to getting into a conflict because, and I, and I, I wonder if I have it. Do I have it on here somewhere? Um, did I choose it? Oh yeah, okay. I'll, um, I guess I'll get to it in a minute. Um, I was sure I had it. Hang on. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll come to it. I'll mention it right now though, just in case I, I didn't I didn't have it because I'm trying to remember how I organized this. Um, but there was confirmation, and I think I'll actually have that little excerpt uh, come up in a in a couple charts from now. But there was actually confirmation that NORAD was tracking with their radar systems multiple inbound uh, aircraft because of these the radar echoes that they were getting during this communication. So imagine, imagine being NORAD. And not only can you not scramble your folks, right, because you can't even get contact with them, but you're tracking multiple inbound aircraft because of what happens typically with radar when, when the sun is interfering with radio bursts. You get these multiple, you get these echoes of, of aircraft that um, it's either, and I, and I don't even quite understand exactly how the, the radar echoes occur, but they, you might actually be seeing your own aircraft and then it's showing them in different locations. And so you're like, well, which one, if you're, if you're aware that it's the same aircraft and you know it's a radar echo, then you're fine. Like we do today, we know when radar echoes occur and, and aircraft because we know what's going on with the sun, but back then they didn't. So when these radar echoes would occur, they may have been seeing their own people in air, but they couldn't identify them because they're like, whoa, what are these bogeys here? What, are, what the hell is this? So imagine being NORAD trying to figure out what in the heck was going on, tracking what they were scared were, you know, hostile forces, air forces coming in, and then, feeling like they were being jammed because they couldn't get radio contact with any of their planes and any of their company. So <laughs> can you imagine the hairs on the back of the necks of these, of these uh, um, officers and, and the, the, you know, the command, in, uh, the SAC command? So luckily they got uh, informed very, very quickly by uh, the SDRC that this is a solar, we are witnessing a very strong solar event 
occurring, big solar flare at the time, and uh, you need to trust us, just trust us. Luckily they did, because otherwise they would have scrambled planes and they would have done a lot more. Um, stuff that they didn't, they still to this day have not declassified. <laughs> but yeah, that was a big, big issue. And here's the thing, uh, these radio bursts, here's a, here's a, a plot of, again, frequency. Now we're, now we're looking at a plot of frequency. Okay, so this is frequency going up. You see where we're sitting at? 100,000 megahertz. Okay, we're now way into the gigahertz range, right? Tens of, tens of not hundreds of gigahertz here. And then this is the order of magnitude, the peak um, flux. So we had massive fluxes, as you can see, right? Down in the 600 and some odd, okay? We had big fluxes up in here, okay, at the nine, nine gigahertz. But we actually had fluxes that actually were non-trivial, even clear up here. This was at 22, 35 gigahertz and 22 gigahertz. Can you imagine with today's spacecraft, how we use these frequencies and we believe that they are foolproof when it comes to the sun. And now the sun is showing us yet again, nope, we could, I can scream that high. <laughs> this blows my mind. If this event were to happen today, remember GNSS, that's at 1.4, 1.2 gigahertz, right? We're seeing massive frequency, <clears throat> I mean, um, fluxes, easily up to that level and way beyond. And then ADS-B transponders, that's at one gigahertz and 900 megahertz. That's where some of the worst of it was. So we would have had planes completely need to be grounded. We would have had very little, if any, communication because now even radars that are directly communicating to planes, remember how we saw from here, wait, yeah, even the even the faces with non-sun directed orientations likely had side and back lobes that were impacted. So radars that weren't even pointing into the sun. The sun, in other words, the sun didn't either have to be setting or rising in order to affect these radars that are looking at, at these at these, you know, looking at planes, let's say, in the modern age, looking at planes trying to take off or land, right? This is air traffic control. Over the entire day side of the Earth. Because we rely on, we rely on those transponders now, right? We rely on ADSB, heavily. We rely on ADSB. So, yeah, twenty-two gigahertz. I just summarized it here. Okay, it's clear that the spectrum is falling off to higher frequencies. Uh, there was some argument at that time that they thought things were actually getting getting worse as you got to higher frequencies. So there is a kind of a top end here, but this is one of the highest I've ever seen. I mean, I think I've seen 18 gigahertz before. I've not. 22 and 35, that's, you know, but I'm not a radio astronomer. So some radio astronomer, astronomers may be going, ah, our sun can do that in its sleep. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know. To me, this is pretty insane. So this was, this is why this one also, you know, you're beginning to see how even though this particular set of events, as we're going to see with the solar wind uh, and the, the CME that's hitting, may not even be close to classifying as a Carrington class event, but it does just from the radio bursts alone, okay, from, from the, the, so the sudden ionospheric disturbances alone. So let's take a look at the solar wind, okay. So here's now not talking about hours, rather, but days. So this is days. So this is a long period of time, okay. And here we're looking at, um, this is a neutron monitor looking at like radiation storm and the Forbush decrease that occurs when you have a big solar storm hitting. Yes, and again, for those who might be new to my mini courses, I know I'm throwing a lot of terms at you. This is an advanced course, which means you do, you'd be, you'd benefit from looking at a lot of my other courses that give you the basic fundamentals to get to where we are here, talking about some of these advanced topics. Um, so a Forbush decrease has been explained um, during when I talk about radiation storms. I don't talk about that, about a four-bush decrease as far as I remember. 
I don't talk about it when I talk about coronal mass ejections. I talk about it when I talk about radiation storms because they go into cosmic rays. And, um, and that's really what we're talking about this. But this big dip here is caused by um, this, the big solar storm that comes out and it actually kind of envelops Earth and kind of protects it in this bubble. And it causes the cosmic ray um, flux to drop quite, quite precipitously. And so that's what you're seeing here. And um, so that's, that's why they, they included that. And if I were to show, a, um, and I might show it, I don't think I do, but we actually see a ground level event right here, which is um, the radiation storm, which peaks. Okay, uh, so, so that's the, 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 the neutron monitor from the South Pole. This is the AE index, which shows substorms. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a min minute. There's the F10.7. I don't know why they really needed it, but you can see that it actually did peak during this period because of that, that um, um, set of, uh, or the, the, that sunspot cluster and everything that was going on, um, which is interesting. I kind of would have expected, because uh, I know that that sunspot cluster itself caused it a real big dip. Oh, oh, this is the F10.7. That's why not TSI. This is the F10.7. So the radio noise peaked. Okay, that's better. Um, then we have the AP index, which is kind of like the KP index. It's just the numbers are, it's just one number per day. It adds up all the KP for the entire day and just, and just, uh, um, so it's a bigger number, but it, it kind of gives you the, uh, the idea of whether there's big geomagnetic storming or not. DST, we talked about DST before. Um, there's the KP index, so the KP and AP are very similar. This just has more detail. Here's the solar wind speed, so the speed of this, the big solar storm coming, or the storms that came. And then there's the density. As you can tell, a little bit ratty, right, because it's 1967. So we did have a little bit of, of solar wind measurements. We really didn't have much out there um, to help us, uh, but uh, a little bit. So you can see, we'll, we'll start at the proton density. 16, this is 16 particles per cubic centimeter. The storm that we have right now is sitting at 16. You go out and you take a look. Just even the filament that hit the other day was sitting at like 20. So is this big? Nah, not at all. And then it jumps down to zero where really the CMEs are, okay, when the CMEs hit Earth. So um, not real impressive, to be totally honest. Plasma speed, 600 kilometers a second. My goodness, we have fast wind that goes that fast. The last solar wind speed or solar wind pocket of fast wind that we got just you know, a week ago, 700 kilometers a second. Is this fast? No. Normal, average, meh, for a CME. I wouldn't have looked at this and said, oh, Carrington, <clears throat> not a chance, okay? KP index, did it go to nine? Yes, it did, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Went to nine for a short while, why? Two CMEs together and had the right orientation. Thank goodness for that, because it actually gave them some aurora, it made it at least noteworthy. Um, DST, what we saw, it went down to, well, this says it went down to almost 400, three, three something, right? Yeah, DST reached minus 337. So a decent, a decent geomagnetic storm, okay, right? We had KP of minus, of, of nine. DST reached minus 337. Check it out, though. Isn't it funny? This storm, even as slow it is, as it is, had a, a more intense DST drop then did the 1972 storm, which was the fastest on record. So if we judge it by speed, oh, that, that Carrington class event that has the fastest on record, it's going to give us the biggest, strongest storm. It's going to knock us to the dark ages and back. Its DST was minus 125. While this measly little pitiful solar storm at 600 kilometers a second outdid it by a lot. Isn't that wild? This 1972 event took 14 hours to reach Earth. This one took, if you're dyslexic, it took 41. Okay. This one, much, much slower and yet much stronger storm by a lot. Right? Much, much more aurora, in fact. So it lies in the top 10 of the space age in terms of being impactful, but not if you were to judge it by speed or density. Part of it was because it was a double header. You had two CMEs back to back. Okay. Part of it was because magnetically it was oriented the right way. 
See how Carrington class events are a problem, right? This thing didn't even belong on that. Remember that, that speed sheet I showed you, right? That showed where all the, the fast events were. This one didn't even make it because 40 hours was off, was way off the chart. It was just, you know, too slow to even register. So it didn't even register as a Carrington class event. And yet it's one of the top 10 storm impacts of the space age. And it had, up until the Halloween storms, it had the biggest radio burst or set of radio bursts in history. Almost got us into a dang nuclear war. <laughs> to, to, to the extent that some of the details are still quiet. <laughs> we don't even know some of the details. The sad thing is, they weren't done. While this storm was hitting and causing all the, the kind of havoc that a superstorm hit causes, because that's getting into here is about a superstorm. The 1859 Carrington class event, that had a DST of, we had to reconstruct it, but we had a DST of anywhere between like 1100 and 1700, minus 1100 to 1700. This doesn't even come close to that. It's still a decent storm, but not minus 1700 nano Tesla, right? So was it the biggest, you know, event that would hit? No, no it isn't. But it still was bigger than the fastest because the fastest was just a bumper car. Even I get confused saying, well, does this belong as a Carrington class event? Well, maybe if you look at it like this, right? But it had such a massive impact on society because we were in the Cold War and radio frequencies that we're using, that we were using at the time were limited limited mainly to the HF and VHF range. And so you block out those frequencies and you're in real trouble. Turned out this one would have blocked out frequencies in the higher bands. If we had, if that thing happened today, it would have drowned out the entire satellite fleet. We would have lost a major amount of communications for it temporarily. It doesn't, it doesn't disable the spacecraft. It doesn't damage the spacecraft necessarily, right? That may happen with the storm or the radiation storm or something, but it's sure not going to happen from the radio bursts. But it would have killed our communications, our ability to communicate because of the screaming of the sun. And so could that have triggered something? If we didn't have a Space Weather Prediction Center set up, could that have, especially right now as we're, you know, sitting in the political climate we are with multiple wars going on in the world, would this have raised the you know, the, eye, the, the, the eyebrows of the brass, of the military brass, heck yeah. So our sun is capable of doing it. And, you know, let's hope it doesn't during this cycle, at least not while all this political, you know, craziness is going on, because that's, that's not good. Um, but luckily we have space weather prediction centers right all over the world now. And, and people are becoming more aware of it. So the chances of it being mis- you know, if, if the sun were to do something like this event and, and cause these issues, uh, the chances of it being, you know, misread as being a hostile effort by some enemy wouldn't, because we know. We know to look. We know to look all the time now. Thank goodness for that. But if we didn't have one, boy, <laughs> it, it could be, you know, it'd be just as dangerous as, as it was back in the 60s. Um, even more so because we, our weaponry is much more intense, right? But hopefully this gets you thinking, right? Hopefully this like kind of gets you to go, whoa, we do need to take space weather seriously. Um, but we don't, we don't want to be um, stupid about it and call and scream fire and brimstone when it's not really happening. But the interesting thing, getting back to this, the interesting thing about this is that even during all of this, after this, these CMEs hit, this is 40 hours later, Remember, 40 hours after the, the solar flares, remember that a period of time was like 10 days that this bad actor was on the sun, unleashing whatever it wanted. Flare, radio you know, burst after radio burst, solar flare after solar flare, CME after CME, radiation storm after radiation storm. So the S SDFC, it is the SDFC, not RC, SDFC still continued to issue alerts, even as these storms were hitting. In fact, I think I have one. Boom. So here's the SDFC report 
ca which captures it, as Dolores calls it, the solar terrestrial mayhem. She's so sing-song about it. <laughs> me, it's like, you know, fetch me my brown pants, right? If I were 1967, it'd be like, I don't want people to see what, what, what may or may not be in my pants. <laughs> um, it says, from Space Disturbance Forecast Center, ESA, ESA uh, Boulder, Colorado, Space Disturbance Forecast Number, blah, blah, blah. Issued May 26, 1967, the proton event continues as well as the very severe magnetic storm. During the next 12 hours, major flares are likely. The importance uh, to normal flare at uh, 2602 uh, or yeah, 0205 Zulu has been reclassified, reclassified as importance three normal. So they had these scales, and I forget what the exact scales were, one normal, two normal, three normal. The flare did not occur within uh, the major delta configuration, but may add to the present proton event. Aurora is reported as far, far south as New Mexico. And then it's signed by, um, I forget the, the scientist who, who was doing this. So these are, they kind of look like the ICAO advisories, don't they? And if you look at the Space Weather Prediction Center, when you see the forecast, forecast discussions and some of their quick blurbs, a lot of them look like this, still to this day. Interesting, huh? How we kind of set it up to be like this. And how that, that, that is still with us so many years later. The same kind of thing. So these people obviously were extremely busy. And when they're talking about the major delta configuration, they're talking about not the delta for the, the you know, the Bravo Coca, Coco Delta, you know, kind of scrambles. They're talking about delta configuration on the sun. Okay, so that, if you remember the sunspot cluster, we were talking about how they, they had all these little spots that were magnetic polarity was different than the other. When you have a, a, a polarity popping through, uh, uh, you know, I'm talking about the, sub, the, the submarines that are rising to the surface, the enemy submarines that are rising through the surface in the armada of, you know, the enemy fleet, that's the magnetic polarities of, you know, you've got one set of magnetic polarities and then you've got another magnetic polarity rising into the middle of it. That will often be called, classified as a delta spot. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of how it has to do with where it's located in the penumbra and umbra and, so it's, but just imagine it kind of, you know, you're in the camp, the enemy camp, and you surface to the top and you go, oh, whoops, look at me. <laughs> Boy, I'm, I'm in enemy territory. You know, that's a delta spot. So that's what they were talking about. So they were still getting guaranteed, you know, the risk of X-class flares. If you have delta configurations, you typically have the risk of that. So they were busy for that 10 days. Okay. But these were the types of notifications that were continue, continuing to, to arise. Here is um, Akasofu's paper. Akasofu, if you don't know that name, historically one of the one of the the best. He recently, I think back in 2021, did a retrospective of his life um, as a space physicist, and and he, you know he just grew up in the golden era of space physics because he was able to see it birth out of nothing, and you know what what an amazing time to 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 have be in a field is when the field is kind of literally birthing all around you. And so you are literally, the low hanging fruit is everywhere and you are able to just, just be awe inspired by absolutely everything you do. So Akasofu is one of those um, authors who, who literally cut his teeth and created the field, helped create the field of, of space weather. Uh, and we're very much indebted to him. So if you get a chance, um, take a look at some of his work, including his retrospective over the course of time. Worked with people like Van Allen, right? You've heard of Van Allen belts? Yeah. Same kind of thing. These guys were contemporaries. Um, they, they literally started the field. And it reminds me of my good friend, Bern Blake, passed. He was also another who started the field. Um, he, pla he passed just recently, and I, I miss him dearly. He uh, was a good colleague and friend, and had, was a nuclear physicist, and uh, that's how space physicists started. Um, we didn't have space physicists way back in the, you know, 50s. <laughs> so we hired nuclear physicists because we didn't, we knew very little about any of this. And so s the nuclear physicists were the ones that became the space physicists. So Byrne was a originally a nuclear physicist, high energy physicist, and um, he, uh, he, he, <laughs> He died with more, more knowledge in his head than, than it would take 10 people to replace him. Um, he knew so much about materials and, and how, how energetic particles penetrate and alter materials. He, he really was a, a wealth, such a wealth of knowledge. And um, 
sadly, the, the field's going to miss him greatly. Anyway, um, okay. Moving on. <laughs> so DST. So this is that that storm time event, and you can see here's a well, hundred gammas. We remember I talked, I told you before in a previous class. Gamma is the old way of calling a nanotesla. So this is a hundred nanotesla. So you can see, yeah, it's about you know, three hundred and some odd nanotesla between basically here and here, right? Um, so this was a big storm, but was it was it outrageously you know was it the biggest storm we've ever seen? Was it Carrington class? Yeah. yeah more like Superstorm class, right? The class just below Carrington. But it was stronger than the 1972 event, and it lasted quite a, quite a decent amount of time. Because you can actually see here's where the compression happened, right? Where you actually, the storm actually hit. Very small compression, to be honest. Um, so it wasn't a big, fast storm. But once it started going down, it, it had some decent, um, uh, gave us some decent aurora. Here's the AE index. So for those of you, if you're looking here, again, this is 250 gamma. So if you're looking at the envelope, which is kind of what we're looking at to, to a great degree, that's pretty big. So lots of storming at high latitudes, some decent storming at mid-latitudes, uh, and uh, you know, overall some, probably some decent, some, um, some really decent aurora, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, OK, so I'll just read this. So beyond the scales, indices, adjectives, and numerics used in most comparative storm studies, there are less tangible factors that make this space weather storm unique. Okay, so this is this is that argument that why does it belong in a Carrington class as a Carrington class event if it was slow? It was a strong storm, but it wasn't you know something that that should set it above the, in the record books. The geomagnetic effects and radio absorption events were consistent with the expectations for strong to extreme storming. However, these effects were compounded by the superposition effects of multiple CMEs back-to-back, -back, as well as multiple solar flares back-to-back. -back. Remember, it was that second X2 class flare that had that massive radio burst. The first X6, that had the big white light flare and a decent radio burst, but it was the second one that happened while the first one was still calming down that just unleashed this monster. So that was that, and then here at Earth, we had multiple, we had two CMEs back-to-back, -back, or ICMEs, rather, back-to-back, -back, that ended up compounding um, the, the impact and making the storm as strong as it was. So let's say, uh, okay, however, these effects were compounded by the superposition of effects and by the extraordinary radio bursts, which caused the, quote, drastic impacts to NORAD's early warning systems. So NORAD was really, really in trouble. <laughs> at this time. It just basically killed them. Okay. We argue that these additive effects and the repercussions of this storm pushed the May 1967 storm into the historically great category, similar to those listed in Hapgood 2010. So Hap Mike Hapgood has a category in a nice paper. He talks about reviewing these, these big storms and what classify as big storms. So even scientists, as you can see, kind of argue, well, does this belong here? Does that belong there? See how tough it is to kind of organize and categorize a Carrington class event and really what that really entails? It's such a squishy definition for events. So let's talk about Aurora for a moment. Okay. Here is from Finlay et al. Ionospheric and magnetis, magnetis, or magnetic observations at 1,000 kilometers during a geomagnetic storm in Aurora of May 25 through 26 of 1967. So this is when the, the CMEs hit, right, during that storm where you had minus 337 DST. What you're looking at are, it's kind of neat, one of the surprising that we actually had this, May 1967, uh, because back then we didn't have that many spacecraft up. It was still very early in the, in the age of space weather. And the fact that we had so many visual um, observations in and around magnetometers, uh, you can see them on the, the dots. Da, 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 da. These were all visual uh, observations. All of these were tracks of ex the Explorer passes, um, northbound and southbound passes. You can see them dashed or, or, or straight lined. And so they were trying to correlate, you know, different observations that they were seeing with, with the Explorer as well as auroral, visible, you know, visible aurora. I see an analyses like this today. I, I was very impressed to see an analysis, this, co this, this thoughtful of, a, of analysis doing ground-based and, and space-based um, and visual uh, 
you know, cross, I don't want to say cross-pollination, but, you know, cross-disciplinary, in a sense, cross-disciplinary um, studies, clear back in May in, in, in 1969, because that's when they published this paper. But they were able to gather all of this data. So it shows you where, where they, they saw aurora, right? Saw aurora clear down, you know, um, down in, what, what is this? Is this Tennessee? Georgia, maybe? As far south here. I think they even said New Mexico at some point. Uh, I think I have that up here. But here is the, the KP, we'll talk about that in a sec. Here's the KP index and set of indices on the 24th, the 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th. You read across, okay? So, and then there's the AP, the corresponding AP for those of you who like one number per day. KPs are nice because they se separate it out in, you know, essentially three hour distance. So one three hour, then the next three hours, then the next three hours, then the next three hours. I hope that adds up, to, that should be eight, so it adds up to 24 because <laughs> there's 24 hours in a day, right? So we had low KP ranges for, for the 24th. Then you started seeing them on the 25th. This is when the first storm hit, got up to a G4, KP of eight. Here's a G3, G4, and then G5, okay? The pluses and minuses, eh, I'm not gonna go into the details of what that means. I've talked about them before when I've talked about the, in the E series, and we talk about um, the KP index, how to read it. The plus is, it's kind of like having, you know, a, if, if it's an eight plus, it's an eight and a half in a sense. If it's a nine minus, it's a, you know, it's the same thing as an eight and a half in a sense, it's a little bit higher. I guess I should say it's 8.3 if it's an eight plus. It's a 8.7 if it's a nine minus. So the minuses and pluses really kind of say it's a little bit higher than this or a little bit lower than, you know, whatever number that they're showing. So that's kind of how, it's a squishy way of saying what it means. Uh, but as you can see on the 26th, so we had from the late on the 25th through the 26th, we had um, KP of nine. Right, and then it goes drops back down to to so this is a G5, and then it drops back down to a, a G3, right, and then it kind of calms down, but then it pops back up again. So we had yet another um, goes up to a G a G3 uh, on the 28th. So back to back to back. So you had essentially a big pounding on the 25th and 26th. That's where we had the biggest DST drop, but then you had on the 28th you had yet another. So a lot of stuff going on right, from this, from this storm, this set of st storms. And that's what you oftentimes see with these Carrington-class events, is they should be called Carrington-class, each event should be called events, plural, because typically they are compounded. They're, they're typically not just one and done, right? But it's clustered and, and clumped together as a single event. So here's something funny that I found. I was always looking for auroras, trying to find information on aurora, any pictures, any this, any that, any newspaper clippings. Not a lot. There really wasn't a lot out there. But in my deep dive, I found Quora. Okay, right? You guys ever use Quora? Right? People ask these random questions and then other people answer. <laughs> sure enough, whoops, hang on. Let me, I got to fix this. I, this is supposed to pop in. Um, second. There we go. Okay. So, I just have, it stumbled upon this. It said, what, someone asked this question, what solar event caused massive aurora borealis in the mid-1960s? He says, living in Bellevue, Ontario, north shore of Lake Ontario, about midpoint running east-west, in, in, in the mid-1960s, I recall two incidences between roughly November 1965 and February 1968 when the aurora borealis was so bright and high in the sky that we noticed it from our living room above the houses just across the street. He said, um, even seeing the aurora in the vicinity of Bell, uh, uh, Belleville today, even in, even in a darkness preserve, seems outrageously far-fetched as it is never visible within a couple hundred miles. I find that amusing. Um, really? We, 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 I think they don't know when to look. The notion of detecting it from, out, from inside a lighted room, even faintly, likewise approaches absurdity for most of the populated regions of Canada. Okay, I, if you're an aurora photographer in this day and age and you're with our space weather community, you probably know that's obviously someone who doesn't pay attention to space weather indices because it's very easy to see aurora in Ontario um, when we have big storms. People could very well see it tonight, <laughs> for, for example. Uh, and we are not getting a Carrington class event. But it was very interesting that, that, um, that this person was trying to hunt down this period of time because they saw aurora from their living room 
you know, over the houses, you know, on a well-lit street from a lighted living room, and they looked out because something seemed bright, and they looked out, and over the rooftops of the houses in their neighborhood, they saw this really bright aurora that tells you how bright it must have been, right? That's a big storm. So here's, here's the funny thing. Here's the neat answer. So this gentleman, John Briggs, whose name I have heard, I have seen before, says, this was likely the major solar flare and associated geomagnetic storm of May 1967. I saw it too. The aurora nearly filled the whole sky as seen from my home in Westport Point, Massachusetts. This was likely the night of May 25th through 26th, 1967, when the geomagnetic storm was at its maximum. I was only a boy in second grade at the time. My parents and I were riding home after dark, and we noticed the aurora in our way, or on our way. It must have been the early evening. Our home was a dark, was a dark and rural site, and from there we could see that the display was spectacular and extended far past zenith toward the south. They had to look south for the aurora. So it passed over them. The auroral oval had opened and moved south of them. He says, uh, he said, in, in August, and then he, interestingly enough, he says, in August 1972, I attended a summer, summer astronomy program called Camp uh, Uraniborg. We were thus very lucky to be watching and fully aware of another major solar event and associated geomagnetic storm early that month. I went on to become a staff member at Sky and Telescope in the 80s and later was an engineer involved for several years at the National Solar Observatory, NSO. He, he says, how the world turns. So he actually got into doing space weather stuff and reporting on uh, astronomical uh, space weather events, partly because of his experience as a kid. And I thought that was just so amazing um, to just kind of happen upon that that there's some anecdotal information from people who were young, right? And we've seen this before, where people have such a, a connection that it gets them interested in, in Aurora. As a matter of fact, one of our moderators can tell you a story. Mike Richardson can tell you a very interesting story about how it motivated, uh, one of these big events, helped motivate him to, to pursue uh, amateur astronomy. So it's, it's neat to see this over and over again. And, and hopefully our, our generation as we continue to raise awareness about space weather, we're getting more and more people um, getting the bug, right? Catching the bug and then making space weather part of their lives because it's so fascinating. But um, yeah, did, they, did these guys potentially know when they were seeing a war over their living room that a nuclear war was being currently averted because that solar storm, that impact, that geomagnetic storm and, and the solar flares, the radio bursts were causing NORAD to rethink <laughs> pressing the button, <laughs> launching battalions into the air and possibly lighting up. Because you can imagine, this was from the United States side. What do you think the Russians were doing? Do you think they had it any better? Probably not. Now, if they were on the night side, they did. But remember, the world rotates, right? So you get back to the day side pretty quickly. In 12 hours, you're back on the day side. And those big solar flares and radio bursts, they were coming fast and furious. So guaranteed, you're going to have times where, you know, you're going to be in the day side when you're getting these big uh, disruptions. So I don't think there was really any country uh, in the world that was necessarily spared from a very, you know, tense time militarily. But meanwhile, people were looking at, you know, their calendar or looking at their their, um, that your aurora out there going, whoa, this is crazy. Okay, um, let me see where I am. I thought I was going to get through this faster than I did. My goodness, how far away am I from being done? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty close. I'm pretty close to getting done through this one. I've got, I've got, yeah, one more. Let me do one more slide and then I'll stop. I probably won't go into the other events today because I've been talking for quite some time. Um, this is a long, this has been a long talk. So I will, I will likely have to give the other events later. That's too bad. I wanted to kind of talk about those. But one thing I will mention, um, we also had, because we had big radiation storms, because we had a big solar storm, a uh, big, you know, Earth geomagnetic storm, we also had atmospheric inflation. And at the time, here's a paper by Allen et al., uh, where we, we actually had, uh, I forget which spacecraft this was, the, Lo the Logax, um, 
aboard Agena. Uh, yeah, or, or, that's why I don't know it. I don't know this spacecraft. This is a, probably an ionospheric um, mission. I, I'm, it's, that's my weakest field is ionosphere. So I don't know all of the, the, the spacecraft that they used and the, the instru instrumentation that they used. But here is the instrument and on the Agena uh, space vehicle that was in a near polar orbit. And so it was doing laps, so to speak. And I pulled out a couple plots that were very interesting because here is a plot, this is of latitude. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's basically over its day side, the day side plot as it goes over the pole, right? So it's going from, from very low latitude, I mean, not low latitude, but southern latitudes through the equator and then up to high latitudes, whew, right? Because it passes over near polar orbit, you know, so it's flipping over this way. Um, and what this is is, is a plot of Basically, your quiet time density uh, of the upper atmosphere, and I forget exactly what altitude, what altitude was this thing at? 150 kilometer height? Yeah, I believe so. Whoops. 150 kilometers. So this is a polar pass going from southern hemisphere up to the northern hemisphere and over on the day side of Earth during these geomagnetic storms. And what they've done is they've normalized it so that you can see the ratio of quiet time density. So what they did is they have a, a day, a, a period of time where there was no storming, and what was the density of the altitude uh, at that at that height, at 150 kilometers, during the quiet time, and then what was it during the um, storm? And they they had and you know, they put this they made this ratio. So you can see unity, that is everything quiet, right? So if the if the numbers are on unity then you know it's, everything's just exactly the way it was uh, when it was quiet. If the numbers are up here, <laughs> right, this is a factor of two, okay, and you can see it dips down a little bit, down to a little below a factor of, of one, 100% increase, 200% increase, right? So you've got this kind of wiggle kind of structure as this thing kind of goes up, down, up, down, up, down. These are very similar to what I had shown before as hot spots. Um, that's what this thing was basically flying through. and and so you get these these clusters, these period, these regions of high density, okay? But you can see the ex atmospheric inflation during these storms was quite strong, right? Getting over, what is that, 200%, right? So that's pretty intense. Um, we had Starlink, they would definitely have had problems having, having the, the inflation be that high. Uh, and because this isn't that much different and I do believe the inflation would have been easily, easily that much, um, you know, or close enough to that much at, uh, at higher altitudes. Um, and so would Starlink have had issues? I absolutely believe so, especially over the fact that it lasted multiple days. Um, and so they have that one, and then they have, let's see, they say, the most clearly developed dayside response occurs just after the main peak of the storm, figures four and five. So this is figure four. I'll show figure five in a second. That's figure four. Um, yeah, they say that the, the, the it, P naught or rho naught rather is the quiet time density. Um, so that's derived from the data from a different revolution, a different orbit uh, just before this. So when things were quiet. And so... Um, Rev 54 is not shown because it's incomplete. Okay, so when I show Rev 55, that's so they had they had 53, then 54 they don't show it because they they didn't get enough data, and then 55. So so multiple you know one full Rev after, and you're still dealing with if anything it's gotten worse at 2.5 now, is the ratio. So 250 percent. So this lasted days. Okay. So would we have had problems? With Starlink, absolutely. And all these low, other low constellation, you know, these Leo constellations, birds, absolutely. This is, for, in, 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 um, incidentally, that's the word I was looking for, is the event, and I didn't have time to go find that data. Um, this is the event in which NORAD lost half its catalog of Leo satellites. For, for we had so many, we had such atmospheric inflation that the drag got so strong that the Leo, the, the number of low Earth orbiting satellites dropped by half. <laughs> um, and I know there's data on that. I have to find it. It's it's either I hope it's not an aerospace technical report. I remember reading it, 
um, when I was in aerospace, and I hope it's out, I can find it maybe in IEEE or something. I hope it's written as an open paper, because then I can cite it for you. Um, but yeah, it, it, this was a big, big deal during that period. And, and thank goodness we had stood up the um, SDFC uh, just three years prior, or two years prior, rather, in 1965, because otherwise we wouldn't have understood any of this. But this is when aerospace and, and all those, those FFRDCs that started helping the, the Air Force understand what was going on with space weather, this is when all of them were really beginning to ramp up because we had such big impacts. It was the beginning of the space age and it was um, at the height of, of you know, the Cold War. And so there were so many things that we didn't understand about space weather that made things so unbelievably tumultuous at that time. So the summary of the effects, I just tried to put down some, some of the biggest issues. It had the largest solar radio burst of the 20th century at specific frequencies, um, mainly 606 megahertz was one of the biggest. And just a neat little anecdotal note, the F10.7 flux that I talk about, right, we talk about the solar flux and I show them on my five day outlooks all the time. What are we sitting at, like 150 right now? Look what it rose to, 8,000. Give you an idea, for those of you who are amateur radio operators, could you imagine seeing me write 8,000 on my solar flux numbers? When I say, you know, okay, we're, okay, we're sitting in the high triple digits. This is, <laughs> I don't even think I have room on my five-day outlooks for 8,000 SFU. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of just how intense this was. And that's why we had white light flares. Okay. Military radio technologies were se severely impacted by multiple intense solar radio bursts up to around 10 gigahertz. I, I just kind of rounded. Um, solar energetic particle deposition causing ionospheric heating and radio communication issues. The polar cap experienced ongoing communication outages for over a week. Could you imagine if we had polar flights back then? We didn't have nearly as many then. General disruption of ionospheric radio and ground to satellite communication channels for a good portion of the 23rd of May and also May 24th and 25th. We had satellite drag effects that were extreme, causing significant loss of NORAD LEO catalog. The near Earth inner heliosphere was in a cosmic ray shadow. <laughs> that was that's what they used, that's what they call it. Isn't that funny? I've never heard it called a cosmic ray shadow, but that's the Forbush decrease for more than two weeks. That's how many CMEs were hitting us. So there were lots of other small CMEs that happened afterwards. Okay. The inner radiation belt and that's how long it took us to recover. The inner radiation belt variations in the electron content were still being measured months after the initial event. So in other words, you had the radiation storm plus the energization of the radiation belt particles from, from the um, big CMEs hitting, the ICMEs hitting. And that accelerates the particles to create really intense fluxes in, in geo, for example, for electrons. And it takes months for that to calm down. That is a big storm. Would we have lost satellites, big, big satellites in geo? like we have now? Yes, likely. Um, and I, I probably should go back and look to see if there were other satellites being, did there were satellites, other satellites being impacted. I just don't know how many satellites we had out back then. Uh, GEO was, was um, you know, was, it was, there were definitely satellites out there, but not a lot, not in 1967. Uh, however, the storm, this particular storm was not significant enough to cause extreme geomagnetically induced currents. So no notable power grid or utility impacts were recorded, not that I saw. Isn't that interesting? So you can have these, these, um, these big, and, and it has to do, because it, it definitely was a superstorm, and it definitely had aurora that allowed that, but I don't, I don't know why in this particular sense, why we didn't get um, more GIC, more reporting of outages. Um, it may have been that when the storm hit, the most intense part of it, when it, we went to, to you know, a G of, uh, um, a scale of a five, a G5, perhaps there just wasn't land over, you know, going past midnight at that time, and it may have just had, been, had to do with the diurnal variation. I, something that I would like to look into a little bit more, but I never had a chance to because, you know, gosh, look how much stuff I gave you, right? But it's definitely something that um, if I have time to, to look into more deeply, I definitely will. Between that and the NORAD catalog, I'd love to find that paper um, to show you and share that stuff with you. Those are the things I'd really love to, to share. Um, but again, not that, I, not that I know of, did it have nearly the impacts that we saw with like the EMP, the E3 EMP component 
um, didn't have the impact of the 1989 events, but it did have the solar, uh, the uh, radio burst signatures that really, really is the reason why this particular event is in the history books, right? So again, how do you define a Carrington class event? Kind of depends upon what you're looking for, right? But none of this stuff is going to be quantitative enough to be able to give you any sense of it. Um, maybe from these definitions, you would call this a Carrington, this one a Carrington class event, but you won't really understand why, right? But then again, from a geomagnetically induced, you know, current perspective, eh, it was a nothing, not a nothing burger, but not enough to cause severest distress. So I won't get into more events in the, in, you know, what I want to talk about next is the day GPS died in 2006 from a very similar thing. Um, we had big radio bursts. And so I was going to give you something that, that, a storm that you probably didn't know occurred and the severe impacts from it that were very, very similar to the issues that NORAD had. Um, but I, I obviously, I'm going to take way too long if I try to jump into that now. So I'll probably jump into that next time. I'll do a review of this, of this event, and then we'll jump into that. And then I'll also talk about the 20 to 2015 event that had a ton of radar echoes. So a very similar thing. Once again, big radio burst. As a matter of fact, the 2015 event, uh, if I were, well, no, I think it's a 20, 20, 2006 event, um, is like second or third under the, under the Halloween event and this 1967 event. That's the, like the third highest we ever had uh, for a radio burst. And we'll, we'll see why. We'll talk more about it. But see, the point that I begin to get to is that you don't have to have a Carrington class event in order to have something that has, in a sense, Carrington class impacts, right? And, and that's something that I want people to understand, is that everybody is so busy looking for the biggest, the fastest, the scariest, the, you know, the X factor, right? Oh, God, it's an X-20, it's going to kill us. Um, they're so busy looking at that that they completely miss the lower level events that actually could wreak more havoc and be more dangerous for, you know, relative to impacts, you know, societal impacts. And we, we need to be very careful when we talk about Carrington class events and not blind ourselves and bias ourselves in a way that ends up hurting us. Um, because it's the things, it's not just, it's not, it's, it's usually never the things you see. It's always the things that you miss that end up surprising you and, and biting you in the butt. So we can't lull ourselves into a, a sense that, okay, we know what we're looking for. Because uh, there are times when we don't. And there are times that we don't, we, we get stuff we don't expect. Both in a good way and in a bad way. Okay. So that's kind of some of the things that I want to want to begin to focus on a little bit as we move into some of the events in the modern age, and talk about why some of these events really should be paid more attention to than even some of the Carrington class events we've had. Okay. And why the focus on the 500-year storm really is not necessarily the way to go about it, not the way to look about look at space weather, and not the way to prepare for it either. Um, but I'll save all of that for another time. So, I have not looked at the, you guys' comments in a while, so I will pause now and ask if you guys have questions. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this, this uh, second or third, this third installment, um, and you kind of got your mind working in a slightly different way. So, uh, let's see, okay. Reef and dive in a hundred year period with our tech, I feel we are, we are, I feel we are like someone happy floating in the, in the middle of a calm ocean in a small boat, as if big waves do not exist. <laughs> True. The last two solar cycles, in particular cycle 23 or 24 and, and possibly even this one, um, and maybe, maybe cycle, yeah, cycle 23, 24, and possibly 25, these cycles have been lower than average. Uh, I think cycle 23 is maybe about average. And so the scary thing is that we've been lulled into a sense of complacency. And that is when a lot of this modern tech with like GPS and, and smartphones, right, and, and, and um, satellites, high, high frequency satellite communication, all of this kind of stuff has kind of cropped up. And so we feel that it's far more robust than it actually is. Uh, because all the sun has to do is 
return to the cycles of the 1960s and 70s, or even the 50s, 60s and 70s, and we will be in a world of hurt. Now, that's slightly different than the cycles of the 80s and 90s, right? The cycles of the, eight, of the, of the 80s and 90s were actually very big geomagnetic storm cycles, but the cycles of the 50s and the 60s, for example, were massive radio burst cycles. I'm a, way stronger radio bursts than we get now. I mean, it, it's unbelievable when I was looking at some of the old data, some of the, some of the intensity of these, these um, uh, radio bursts that we had in the 50s. I mean, it was enough to wake radio astronomers up and go, hey, maybe we should study the sun. This sun's really noisy, you know. I mean, it literally created a whole field because the sun was screaming so loudly. So our, our solar cycle can definitely change um, and, and give us different types of effects and be more uh, effectual in one particular fashion that affects us one way, and then in other cycles be more effectual in a different way. And that's something that I don't think we understand well enough about our star yet, because we just don't have a long enough timeline of events, you know, and our time scales are so short relative to the, sol the solar cycle, right? We just, we just need to think more on the climatological scales when it comes to that kind of thing. So, Julian said, uh, wow, I, I definitely be there for the next episode. Cool. If that, if you, in other words, you like this. <laughs> it does hopefully get you to think um, about this stuff in a different way. Hopefully, hopefully so. Uh, I see people talking about building radiation shelters into spacecraft. Hard to do. Hard to do. Uh, energetic particles typically like to just barrel through stuff, and then trying to to shield yourself oftentimes causes that causes the the shielding to itself become a source. Because when you have thick metal shielding, it, you get secondary products. You get a cosmic ray shower right through that stuff with the energetic particles going through it. So it becomes a source and it, you end up getting cooked even more, getting a higher dose of radiation being from your shield than you did if you just stood out naked and just went, okay, hit me. <laughs> hit me with what you got. So we, there's, we have to be careful. There are certain materials that we, that we need to be careful not to use. Um, okay, question. Is there any internationally respected communication system in emergencies, or what likely would be a usable system that could be depended on. Uh, as I've talked to the FAA and, and talked to their, their spectrum management and, and the Civil Air Patrol and a couple other uh, industries um, specifically about this, really what you have to have are redundant systems, but not redundant the way most people think about it. Redundant systems usually means having two or multiple systems that are identical, that when one breaks, you just turn on the other one, right? And so that's a redundancy. That's a great way to have redundancy, expect when it except when it comes to radio communications and space weather. Uh, you need to have redundant systems that are non-identical, meaning a space weather event, depending upon what it is, might affect this system, but it may not affect that one, if they're totally different technologies. So that's incredibly important for radio communications um, and radar, right? So like ADS-B may go down if we get a radio burst. Like in the 20, 2015, uh, we would get radio bursts in a particular wavelength that was, that was basically took out ADS-B, or would have taken out ADS-B had we been using it that much there. But it took out a lot of the frequency, uh, the radio transponder uh, frequencies, because it was literally chirping right at the same wavelength or frequency rather, whichever way you look, look, want to look at it. So if you have a different system, a secondary system set up, and so this is what I was talking about with the, with the spectrum management people, was that they, they, they were getting upset because a lot of these, what they call the DMEs and VORs, were being shut down. These are the ground-based radars that are extremely expensive to maintain, and people are shutting them down because they're going to ADSB, which uses GPS and you know, in, in from space-based assets, right? Well, the problem is you get a radio burst in, in the L-band, that's not going to affect the radars downstairs. That's going to affect the satellites, you know, the satellites, but the reception of the satellite uh, signals to your aircraft. And so you can literally have outages where ADS-B is going to be worthless, and you're going to have to rely on other systems. But if you shut down all your other secondary systems, you're in trouble. Now, just having two ADS-B responders saying, oh, this ADS-B responder isn't working, so I'll turn this one on. No, <laughs> you're not solving the problem. See, because if, if it's going to take out one, it's going to take out the other. So you have to have redundant systems that are non-identical. 
technologically. And, and that is the big message that I, I try to get across to people, is you've got to be agile. Okay? So, that's, so having a worldwide network of communication is great as long as you have multiple ways of communicating. Um, if you rely on only one small system or one kind of technology, you're, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Hopefully that answered that question. Okay, I saw a couple questions disappear up the top, so definitely throw them back in the chat. <laughs> Would you share your origin story? Are you talking to me, purple guy? <laughs> My origin story how? Uh, how I got into space weather? I could, probably not today, because <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I started out as an artist and, and a musician, believe it or not, and got into space weather in a, um, um, mainly because I was, I love sci-fi novels, and then I figured, I found out the textbooks were stranger than fiction. So the truth is stranger than fiction. That was literally my story. Um, but yeah, I, I did music the entire time through grad school, uh, because uh, just being a scientist would have driven me crazy. So I was writing you know, writing music, producing, being an audio engineer for other bands as well as doing my own music. And it almost took me out of grad school. I almost quit. But my thesis advisor just said, look, just slow down and, and take your time because I don't want to lose you. So that was one of the nice things about Chris Russell is that he, he wanted to make sure I stayed in the field and, uh, and that I didn't go off and become a musician. And so I stayed. And, and um, yeah, there's, there's more to the story, but that's... It in a nutshell, if you're interested in my origin story. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay, so I, yeah, purple guy, it sounds like you're, out, you're talking to other people. Uh, okay. Do we have names for classes that aren't Carrington? Um, you know, Steffi, we have super storms, right? We have, uh, in particular, the, the one that is always called the standard candle is the 1989 event. And that has a unique uh, history as well because it, we, we literally got caught with our pants down as scientists. Um, we did not even observe the CME that left the sun in the 1989 event. And um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny story talking about why. But because of that, uh, we sure changed how we, how we looked at the sun after that and how we did our, all of what we called our CONOPS for uh, instrumentation we started realizing, oh, we need to pay attention to the sun far more often than we do. And uh, it's great to get scientific images and do scientific research, but if it prevents us from being able to observe our star, then we either need to change all our scientific and instrumentation so that it's always observing our star very, very quickly and can get us information down very, very quickly so we can have operational space weather ob observations or we need to branch off and have the scientists do their thing and the operational folks do their thing. And so the scientists can sit there and dally all they want while the operational folks, you know, are just constantly looking at the sun, staring at the sun, recording everything the sun is doing and making sure the right people are, are alerted. Um, that kind of was what the 1989 event kind of is what started that whole branching off of um, in, the, in the open sphere, at least. The military were already kind of doing that. But um, we, we, we took it a lot more seriously after the 1989 event. Um, so that, is, that, is, that and the Halloween storms are probably the most famous super storms where they weren't Carrington class per se, but they had really strong impacts, really societal impacts that were massive. And so um, those are the only two classifications I, I know uh, of, of storms as far as the category of like, greatness, uh, Carrington class, Superstorm, and then um, honestly stealth CMEs, right, which is the other side, the ones that you can't see, and they're dangerous because they're invisible, and you don't even know they're there, and then they team up with fast solar wind streams and can cause moderate level storming. Uh, so those are the only, th the, basically the only three quote-unquote categories of coronal mass ejection style storms that end up impacting Earth that I can think of. And they're very, as you can tell, quite squishy in their uh, um, definitions. So, okay. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. You're telling Purple Guy, yeah, get more information about that, because it's kind of off topic. You know, you can get more, you can actually get more information about who I am and what I did 
what I've done um, just from that video. Remember I told you about the video on my channel? Um, the introductory video. It's, it's an interesting story, which I'm going to replace here pretty quick. Um, probably next year I'll, I'll re-up that video because it's, my gosh, I think it's almost five years old now. Whew. Long time. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, Jim, you're talking about laser, laser, yeah, laser calm. Um, it's, it's in development. Can we use it? You know, I, I think there's even people who are trying to do proposals where you use laser calm um, clear out in inter, interplanetary space, which would be amazing if we can get lasers strong enough. I think the biggest issue with laser calm right now is power. Um, you know, we have LIDARs and stuff that, that can use power, but, but having it be our, your main telemetry, um, it's, it's tough. You know, maybe we'll have laser comm and then radio comm as backup. Uh, but yeah, laser comm is definitely something that, that is in the works. And how well it's going to hold up against space weather events, I think it'll do much, much better. But, you know, every time we think it, there's going to be the next best thing, something ends up happening and, you know, there's something that we didn't foresee. So I am cautiously optimistic about laser comm being... Um, something that will help us avoid all the radio comm issues that we have right now with uh, radio bursts. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh, okay. The sun has been doing a number for about 20 minutes now. Oh, is it a, is it a big solar flare or something? Brian? Um, that'd be interesting. Okay. Uh, Mike says, uh, Mike McCullough says, it's been an outstanding presentation. Thank you, amateur radio operator. Gorman, KM6CDM. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mike. I'm, I'm so glad you liked it. Yeah, it looks like you guys, uh, we may not be having as many questions as we, as we had. So, so uh, you, are you guys as tired as I am? <laughs> you can tell from my voice, right? It's been a long one. Um, okay, keep telling us about these events and how to, get, how to keep us prepared, as prepared as we can. Thank you. You're welcome, Marilyn. Absolutely. Uh, Okay, yeah, Chris, please review the meaning of the minus sign in DST. Yeah, I talk about DST and, and that in the Earth Effects, so that's the E series. DST basically is a, a reduction. It, it, it's measuring the reduction of our magnetic field strength uh, down in from, from something called the ring current. And because of the way the current is moving, it induces a, a magnetic field. And that magnetic field opposes the direction of our Earth's magnetic field. So it causes, it seems, when you add it all together, it seems to reduce the apparent magnetic field strength of Earth. And so certain magnetometers uh, are placed around our globe in certain latitudes to measure that reduction. And how much that ring current gets, you know, riled up, so to speak, uh, that it's riled up by these geomagnetic storms. And so the strong, the more riled up it gets, the stronger the storm is, the more the reduction in our Earth's magnetic field. So that's why DST is negative. It's because it's always a reduction, and then it comes back slowly. So hopefully that's in a, in a nutshell. But you can learn a lot more. Jerry is right. You can learn a lot more from my, from my courses on why that is so. OK. Oh, there's some good interviews uh, out there with other people. Oh, oh, with her from other people. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Thanks, Spirit. I appreciate you saying that. Um, not hard to see why she's an award-winning science communicator. Oh, thanks, Steffi. Yeah, the Spark Award, huh? I, it'll be fun um, in December. I'll, I'll be sure to take, uh, you know, some little cameras with me to record the event. I don't even know what it's going to be like. So, but I'm, I feel incredibly honored um, to to receive the Spark Award and the the honorary, you know, the the, the honors committee. I, I'm very indebted to them, and I'm indebted to my um, my nominators, uh, who I know who they are. I, I won't re I won't reveal. Well, yeah, I guess I can reveal who they are. Um, Liz McDonald from Aurorasaurus and um, uh, Erica Palm Palmerio. So those two colleagues of mine, they nominated me and, and they put a package together that was apparently very impressive. So I, I owe a lot to them and I, um, I didn't know a priori that they were going to do that. Uh, they told me eventually, <laughs> but um, you know, it was, it was really, really, really sweet of them to do. So I'm very grateful. Very, very grateful. So it'll be a fun December because I'm going to go get the be honored in, in December. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I know, Nick. I, it's late here, huh? I am. I think we all should start paying attention to the solar storm that's out there right now and see how it's going. 
Uh, you're very welcome, guys. Um, okay, thanks for the explanation on, on DST. You're very welcome. Okay, guys, yeah, I've been going for a long time, right? So, you're excellent. Looks like I've got through <laughs> all of the questions. I will check really quick because I pr always promise I do this. I'm going to check Patreon really fast to see if there's any questions on Patreon. So let's see if I haven't killed the... Oh yeah, we're still... Um, and let's see. I'm sure you hear me clicking, looking around. Any questions, guys? So, whoops. Through all right, of the questions. Stop. Okay. Uh, Jesse says, okay. Oh my gosh, I'm still getting out. Time lapse of the Aurora Australis. It's been an amazing night here in VIC Australia. Great. I'll have to be playing it during the drive home, only listening, not watching, of course. Yes, yeah, safety first. Spock's daughter, you were here. Jerry Ullman, fantastic. Are you in the right place? Uh, Jerry, hopefully, if you're watching the, the feed, you are. Um, the, but you, the chat is on YouTube, usually. Deepak, okay, let's see. Hating the time change. Yes, yeah, sorry, Rick. Uh, Mark, Mark says, the core is a 2003 American science fiction disaster. Oh, I remember that. The core of the Earth is slowing down, and the crew has to restart the core. Yeah, that's right. That's a great one, Mark. I completely forgot about that. Yeah, I should go look into that now. Because that we were talking at the very beginning of this class, we were talking about the um, magnetic field of the Earth weakening, right? Oh, yeah, see, my computer's telling me it's time to go. Uh, we were talking about the magnetic field of the Earth weakening. I should, yeah, that's a good one. I'll go look at the core. And I'll go look at, back at all of you guys' comments to see if anyone else put other stuff up there, too. I always go back and I look through the comments, so so don't feel that you, you know, if you, if I, you didn't get seen by me live, don't don't stress it. You do get seen by me, because I do read the comments um, and take time to to uh, to look at them. And, and a lot of that factors into, you know, how I teach in the future. So I really appreciate it. Okay, guys, um, looks like that's it. Please enjoy tonight if there's more Aurora. Um, oh, I will do this just for those who are hanging out for the last second here. Let's take a look at the solar wind because I wanted to show. Let's, I'll, I'll see what it is right. I wanted to see if I could ugh, it just turn north. Look at that. Ugh. Magnetic field is north now. Poop. Still pretty intense though. Uh, it's at 20 nanotesla. Let me see what the what the. Ugh. Boy, this sure looks like a. Ugh. This sure looks like like we're not hitting the core of this structure. This sure looks like the glancing blow. Okay, so, so this may be that south, well, so we have the southward one and then we have the northward one. This looks like it might be the northward one. Let's, because it's just a mess. We're not seeing anything like the core, like the slinky, right? I talk about the slinky being in the middle. If we had the slinky, we would have much more ordered field. And I'm not really seeing, I see a little bit of ordered field, but boy, it's really jumbly. Um, just flipping, flopping. So let me take a look, just because I promised you guys I would. Um, ACE real time. So what we do is we look at the ACE real time data and then we look at low energy particles. Oh, uh, shoot. Bummer. No, this looks like this may be the big one. So what I was looking for, the rise in, in particles. And when you get up to the peak, if you can see that there, get up to the peak, here's the rise in particles, here's the ESP. For those of you who know, that's when the shock mainly hits Earth. And then what you look for is to see whether or not the rise, it continues to rise afterwards or it, continues, or it starts really going down. And it looks like it's beginning to go down. And, and I couldn't tell before because we were like sitting right here when I started the class. So if this continues to go down, then that means this is the main course. And the only thing we have left is the fast solar wind. So maybe that event that, was, that we thought was a direct hit, maybe it has, maybe that solar wind, as we talked about yesterday, Maybe it has pushed it further north and has not allowed it to really give us the direct hit we were hoping for. So this may be the peak, guys. We may be, you know, Australia may have gotten the peak this time because it, it hit really when Australia, like in the wee hours of the morning for Australia. So I don't know. I'll go on Twitter and take a look to see if the UK and, and Europe has gotten any, any shows. I don't know. Is it dark enough over there yet? Um, don't know, guys. Don't know. So, at any rate, hopefully you've enjoyed this, and, and it's still worth, worth looking at the storm. It's still worth kind of paying attention. Remember, we do have fast solar wind as dessert, and that's going to be coming here 
around the seventh. Um, so, you know, it's what we're almost in the sixth now. So we'll keep watching how this solar storm wanes and, uh, and then we're going to get that fast solar wind. So it'll be a little bit of a, of, a, of a lull and then it'll pick back up again. Probably won't get to a G3. Could easily get, get up to a G1 again. May, may um, if I go back to, I think we're probably still at a G2 because it's still waning, right? Oh yeah, we're still at a G, we're at a G2 right now. So this may wait, whoops, this may wane to, you know, a G1 and then may get down into active conditions and then it may pop back up again. Uh, and that will be, you know, so we still could get some decent aurora from this, okay? So hopefully that was a good enough kind of last minute little, little storm update. And like I said, I'll be on Twitter and uh, you guys can join us there, do some field reporting, let us know if you see Aurora, it'd be awesome, and I'll be reposting your stuff, okay? All right, take care, guys. Thanks so much, and thank you, Jerry and Mike. Really appreciate your uh, moderating the, the, the feed.